Welcome to Domain 3 of the Security Plus Exam Cram series, which focuses on implementation. That is a really broad topic. And in this session, we're going to touch on every topic in Domain 3 detailed in the official exam syllabus. Now, the series is designed to help you prepare quickly and inexpensively, really focusing on the key aspects of topics to help you reach in there and pick out the right answer more effectively on exam day. In fact, if you're new to the series, you should probably go back and watch the intro because there's really some important strategy information there that will help you optimize your preparation efforts. It's really intended to be the first resource you use in your prep to identify your weak spots and the last resource you review as a refresher before walking into the exam. I'm glad you're here. We have a lot to cover, so let's get started. Welcome to Domain 3 of this CompTIA Security Plus Exam Cram series. Now, Domain 3 focuses on implementation, which is not only a very large domain in terms of content, but also the most heavily weighted of all five. Now, in this series, we have six core videos. The first is the intro video that includes my detailed exam preparation strategy that's sure to reduce your preparation time and effort and improve your results on exam day. I expect to release five to 10 shorter supplemental lessons around what proved to be more difficult topics for learners based on your questions over time. And in this domain, as with all, remember that I am focusing line by line on the topics that are called out in the official exam objectives. So what you see in the official exam objective document in terms of topics, they're all going to be covered here. The guide I suggest you use is the official Security Plus Exam Study Guide and Practice Test Bundle. That includes a thousand flashcards and practice questions, including online access to those practice exams. So this really eliminates one more resource you need to buy, namely practice exams, to prepare for this exam. You can get it on Amazon.com. I have a link to the least expensive option in the video description. And one more thing worth pointing out is that the bundle includes a 10% exam discount coupon, which effectively pays more than half your cost for the test bundle itself. So great, great value in that respect. And as with all the videos in this series, a PDF copy of the presentation is available in the video description. Folks tell me it's helpful in reviewing for exam day. So let's start with 3.1, given a scenario, implement secure protocols. So we're talking about protocols and use cases here and implement really means choose the right protocol for a use case. But what we're going to do is tie the protocols to their use cases, which should make choosing the right answer on exam day uh, an easier task. So I've put these into tables that will help you review these quickly. You have the protocol on the left, the use case on the right, and you see port and TCP UDP protocol information uh, where applicable listed as well. And you'll see some protocols here that are probably familiar to you if you've been in IT for long. For example, secure shell, port 22, used for secure remote access. Now, IPsec in particular, I think you wanna know the protocols and modes for IPsec because they're called out specifically in the exam objective. So we'll touch on those briefly here in just a moment. And I think it also makes sense for the exam to group by use case as you're memorizing. So for example, if we look at secure SMTP, IMAP4, POP3, SMIME, those are all related to email, right? So we could maybe group those together in our memorization activity. Uh, we could look at SIP and SRTP, which are going to be focused on uh, VoIP and, and internet telephony. Now, I mentioned IPsec protocols and modes we want to be familiar with. So in IPsec, we have authentication header and encapsulating security payload, commonly abbreviated as AH and ESP. So AH provides a mechanism for authentication only. And because authentication header doesn't perform encryption, it's going to be faster than encapsulating security payload. Now ESP provides confidentiality, encryption, and data integrity. And 
it can be used with confidentiality only, authentication only, or both of those together. So it is configurable in that respect. Now, IPsec modes are also important. And the first is transport mode, uh, in which IP addresses in the outer header are used to determine the IPsec policy that will be applied to the packet. This is good for host-to-host -host traffic. And in tunnel mode, two IP headers are sent. The inner packet determines the IPsec policy that protects its content. This is going to be good for VPNs and gateway-to-gateway -gateway security. IPsec does come up in a couple of different areas in Domain 3. I believe these are the most important elements you should understand and commit to memory to be ready for the exam. So let's move into 3.2. Given a scenario, implement host or application security controls. So we'll touch on endpoint protection, database and application security, OS hardening, and boot integrity. So let's start with endpoint protection. So we have antivirus, which at the root of it is designed to detect and destroy viruses. And what it does with a virus is configurable, of course, right? So we may quarantine, for example. And then we have anti-malware, which similar to antivirus stops threats, but anti-malware focuses on all kinds of malware, viruses, trojans, worms, and potentially unwanted programs. And then we have endpoint detection and response. So this is integrated endpoint security that combines real-time continuous monitoring and collection of endpoint data, as well as rules-based automated response and analysis capabilities, which you'll sometimes hear termed investigation even. These capabilities are generally delivered together in a single solution today. And they usually go beyond antivirus signature-based protection to identify potentially malicious behaviors, what we'd call zero-day behaviors or emerging threats. And they're going to use machine learning and artificial intelligence to do that. How that happens will vary by vendor, but AI and machine learning are going to be common elements of that EDR solution. All right, data loss prevention. So this is a way to protect sensitive information and prevent its inadvertent, think unintentional, disclosure. And DLP solutions can identify, monitor, and automatically protect sensitive information in documents. And we're really talking about protecting personally identifiable information, protected health information, customer information, any sort of sensitive business data. And with DLP software, typically you can create policies that you can apply to email, to your SharePoint portals, to cloud storage, and to, in some cases even to databases. And these policies will typically have canned formulas to identify different types of data like PII, like protected health information, like credit card data or they'll provide you the ability to write your own regular expressions to identify what you consider sensitive. So let's talk firewalls for a moment. So when we think about modern firewalls, there's the web application firewall, which protects web applications by filtering and monitoring traffic between a web application and the internet. It typically protects web apps from common attacks like cross-site scripting, cross-site request forgery and SQL injection. Now, many of your web app firewalls will come with pre-configured OWASP rule sets that protect against the OWASP top 10 application vulnerabilities. And then there are next generation firewalls. These are deep packet inspection firewalls that move beyond port protocol inspection and blocking. They add application level, intrusion prevention, and they bring intelligence from outside the firewall, often in the form of consuming threat intelligence feeds. For the exam, I'd know the abbreviations as well. So you'll hear a web app firewall referred to as WAF, web app firewall, and then next gen firewalls are abbreviated NGFW. So let's talk intrusion detection and intrusion prevention. And knowing the difference, I believe, will be important for the exam. So with intrusion detection, or IDS, 
it will analyze the header and the payload. So think packet content. And when a known event is detected, a log message is generated. So think alerting or notification. Now intrusion prevention, on the other hand, will analyze those whole packets, both the header and the payload, looking for known events. And when a known event is detected, a packet would typically be rejected. So the difference between IDS and IPS is intrusion prevention takes action, where intrusion detection is focused on notification. Now 3.2 calls out host-based IDS and IPS. So this really refers to intrusion detection or prevention in software form installed on a host, generally on a server, although you'll see host-based intrusion detection and prevention for client operating systems as well, like Windows 10. And also in the endpoint protection category is the host-based firewall. So this is an application firewall built into desktop operating systems like Windows or Linux. Now, because it's an application, it's going to be more vulnerable to attacks in some respects versus a hardware firewall. And it's fairly important that we restrict service or process access to ensure that malicious parties are not able to simply stop the service or kill the process, thus disabling the firewall. And generally speaking, you're going to see host-based and network-based firewalls used together in a layered defense. We'll have network-based firewalls filtering traffic between network segments, for example, or between the trusted network and the internet. And we might use host-based firewalls on the client operating systems to restrict port access to restrict lateral movement should an endpoint be compromised, for example. So let's talk boot integrity, which ensures that hosts are protected during the boot process so all protections are in place once the operating system is fully operational. Now, Unified Extensible Firmware Interface, or UEFI, is the modern version of BIOS that is more secure and it's needed, it's necessary, for a secure boot of the OS. That is to say the older BIOS cannot provide secure boot. Then there's measured boot, where all the components from the firmware, applications, and software are measured, and the information is stored in a log file. And that log file is on the trusted platform module, the TPM chip that's on the motherboard. Now, trusted secure boot and boot attestation is available in operating systems like Windows 10 that can perform a secure boot at startup where the OS checks that all of the drivers have been signed. And if they haven't, the boot sequence is going to fail as system integrity has been compromised. And this can be coupled with attestation, where the software integrity has been confirmed. Uh, for example, BitLocker implements attestation and its keys are stored on the TPM chip on the motherboard. So in the database category, we have tokenization, which is deemed more secure than encryption because unlike encryption, it cannot be reversed. So it takes sensitive data, like a credit card number, and it replaces it with random data that is the token. That non-sensitive data is the token. As an example, many of your payment gateway providers store the credit card details securely and generate a random token. But tokenization can help companies meet PCI DSS and HIPAA compliance requirements because it's strong protection in that case. Now, in Hashing, a database you know, may contain a massive amount of data, and hashing is used to index and fetch items from the database. And this makes search faster as the hash key is shorter than the data. And the hash function maps data to where the actual records are held. Incidentally, like tokens, hashes cannot be reversed. It's a one-way operation. And salting. So salting passwords in a database is like salting passwords in an identity provider. It adds random text to the password before hashing to increase the compute time for a brute force attack. Incidentally, this also renders rainbow tables ineffective. A rainbow table is a table of hashes for common passwords that basically reduces compute time in a brute force scenario. And because the attacker is unaware of what the salt value was that was injected into those passwords before hashing, the values for the same passwords in their rainbow table won't match 
what would be present in a salted database of passwords. Now let's talk about application security and common controls to prevent attack. So input validation is typically number one on the OWASP top 10 list of vulnerabilities and validating input ensures that buffer overflow, integer overflow, and SQL injection attacks will not succeed against applications and their backend databases. We want to use these anywhere data is entered using a web page or a wizard and ensure that the form only accepts data in the correct format within a range of minimum and maximum values. Incorrect format should be rejected, forcing the user to re-enter the data for that field. Now, cookies are used by web browsers and they contain information about your session. And the problem with cookies is they can be stolen by attackers to carry out a session hijacking attack. To minimize this probability, setting the secure flag in website code ensures that cookies are only downloaded when there's a secure HTTPS session. HTTP headers are essentially designed to transfer information between the host and the web server. And with headers, an attacker can carry out cross-site scripting attacks as it's mainly delivered through injecting HTTP response headers. We can prevent these by entering the HTTP Strict Transport Security Header, HSTS. This ensures that the browser will ignore all unsecure HTTP sessions. Code signing uses a certificate to digitally sign scripts and executables to verify their authenticity and confirm they're genuine. Most of your commercial software companies today implement code signing. And some intrusion prevention systems will allow us to submit that code signing certificate as an entity that indicates any script or executable signed with it is safe and should be allowed to execute. An allow list enables us to specify applications that should be allowed to run. This can be set up using an application whitelist, it's typically called. Firewalls, intrusion detection and prevention systems, and endpoint detection and response systems will often give us an allow list feature where we can specify what should be able to run. And on the flip side, they may offer a block list or deny list feature that uh, enables us to prevent specified applications from being installed or run by submitting that deny list to the specified solution. And here again, firewalls, IDS, IPS, and your EDR systems will typically have some sort of block list feature. Now let's talk about secure coding practices. Uh, a developer who creates software writes code, hopefully in a manner that ensures there are no bugs or flaws. That's what secure coding means. The intent is to prevent attacks like buffer overflow or integer injection. And we can take that a step further by conducting static code analysis. This is where the code is not executed locally, but it's analyzed by a static code analyzer, an analysis tool. The source code is run inside the tool that then reports any flaws or weaknesses. Bear in mind that static analysis requires source code access. On the flip side, dynamic code analysis is where the code is executed and a technique called fuzzing is used to inject random input into the application and the output is reviewed to ensure appropriate handling of unexpected input. This can expose flaws in an application before it's rolled out to production. Now this doesn't require source code access because it's conducted by actually running, you know, executing the code. This can be a little confusing if this is your first time uh, looking at static and dynamic code analysis, so I'm going to present it to you another way, and it's the way we see it presented in the CISSP exam, where static code analysis is called static application security testing. Different name for the same thing. It's analysis of computer software performed with, without actually executing the programs. The tester has access to the underlying framework, design, and implementation, and essentially requires that source code so they can analyze that source code with appropriate tooling or even manually. Dynamic application security testing, that's dynamic code analysis. That's where a program communicates with the web application, you know, executing the app. The tester has no knowledge of technologies or frameworks that the application is built on, but no source code is required. 
You'll also see these referred to as, in the case of static testing, testing inside out because we're looking at the source code inside the app, where dynamic testing is testing outside in. So just another way to look at it. Hopefully that helps. So manual code review is just what it sounds like. It's reviewing code line by line to ensure the code is well written and error free. This takes a fair amount of expertise. It takes somebody who knows how to code and it tends to be tedious and time consuming as one might imagine. Fuzzing is a process I mentioned earlier, uh, whereby random information is input into an application to see if the application crashes or memory leaks result, or if it handles the unexpected input gracefully and returns error information. Uh, we want to use this to remedy any potential problems within application code before a new app is released. And when we do this before release, this is a white box testing scenario. But fuzzing can also be used in a black box scenario, so after release and before production deployment, uh, we can check for improper input validation. So we can use fuzzing to inject unexpected values into a form or a wizard and see if the application handles that unexpected input gracefully. This is going to be a black box testing scenario uh, because there's no need to have knowledge of the framework or access to the source code. So moving on to hardening, We'll start with open ports and services. We should really have only listening ports running that are absolutely necessary. We should filter traffic coming inbound to those ports, restricting access to only the networks uh, that we expect traffic to be coming from, and to disable unnecessary ports and services entirely. So we can handle our filtering through firewalls, whether that's at the network level or a host-based firewall, and we can disable running services or processes to kill unnecessary listening ports entirely. And the registry. So this is a Windows construct and we want to restrict access to the registry and control updates through policy wherever possible. A bad actor who gets unexpected access to the registry can add configurations that persist across reboots, enabling them to establish persistence and to begin moving laterally in your environment. And you always want to take a backup of the registry before you start making changes. Bad changes to the registry, uh, over cleanup, so deleting too much, is not an action you can come back from easily unless you have a backup of the registry. And disk encryption. So drive, drive encryption can prevent unwanted access in a variety of circumstances. And using full disk encryption or self encrypting drives will be a part of this strategy. We're going to talk about both of these later in this module. And then at the operating system, OS hardening can be implemented through security baselines. We want to establish a baseline of what is normal and expected at the operating system level. And the good news about taking an action like that where we standardize security across an operating system, say based on role like a client or an application server, we can apply those through group policies or management tools, MDM like Intune. And those baselines can implement everything I mentioned above here. We can incorporate all those into one baseline configuration. And then there's patch management, sometimes called update management. This is about ensuring that our systems are kept up to date with current patches. In the world of Windows, this means patching on Patch Tuesday once a month and a few out-of-band patches over the course of the year. Your patch experience is going to differ a bit in Linux and vendor by vendor with your network devices. But we want to evaluate, test, approve, and deploy patches. We definitely don't want to take all of our patches to production immediately to avoid unexpected impact. There's definitely a bad patch that gets released every now and again. And we need system audits to verify the deployment of approved patches to our systems. This would include vulnerability scanning once, once a month at least, and some sort of reporting system so we can ensure these patches are actually getting out there. And we want to patch both native operating system and third-party apps. I find that third-party apps are often overlooked, oftentimes because there's not as much automation available to ensure that process is consistent and manageable in terms of effort. You know, it's not made as convenient for third parties. And you want to apply out-of-band updates promptly, especially when we see updates coming out of band from Microsoft, there's definitely a reason for that. Oftentimes it's addressing zero day threats. So you want to roll those out quickly. We do find 
Organizations without patch management will experience outages from known issues that could have been prevented simply by patching their systems. In drive encryption, we have full disk encryption, which is built into the Windows operating system. It's called BitLocker, and BitLocker keys are stored on the TPM chip on the motherboard. In the world of Linux, there's an FDE implementation called DMCrypt, although I don't think you'll hear about that one on the exam. And then we have self-encrypting devices or self-encrypting drives where encryption is built into the hardware of the drive itself. And anything that's written to that drive is automatically stored in an encrypted form. So a good said should follow the Opal storage specification, which is a specification for self-encrypting drives. And then there's the hardware root of trust. So when we implement full disk encryption, they use a hardware root of trust for key storage. It verifies that the keys match before the secure boot process takes place. A TPM is often used as the basis for a hardware root of trust. We'll talk about TPM in just a moment here. So the TPM is the trusted platform module. It's a chip that resides on the motherboard of the device. It's multi-purpose, like for storage and management of keys used for full disk encryption, but that's not its only purpose. It provides the operating system with access to keys for a number of functions, but it prevents drive removal and data access. And finally, sandboxing. An application is installed in a virtual machine environment isolated from our network, in a sandbox, we call it. This enables patching, you know, testing, ensuring that it's secure before putting it into a production environment. We ensure that system is hardened before we expose it to other systems on our network. And it also facilitates investigating dangerous malware. So if we have a security breach, if we have a compromised system, we can take it offline, we can isolate it in a sandbox and allow forensic investigation to continue. In a Linux environment, this is known as change root jail. Moving on to 3.3, we're going to talk about implementing secure network designs. We'll touch on load balancing, network segmentation, virtual private network, and port security, to name a few. So let's start with load balancing. And a network load balancer, an NLB, is a device used to direct traffic to an array of web servers, application servers, or really any other service endpoint. Uh, we usually think of these in the context of web servers, but it's really bigger than that. And there are several ways we can set up a load balancer. The two you want to remember for the exam are the active-active configuration, where we have multiple load balancers acting like an array, all dealing with traffic together as both are active. And you can have an active-active scenario with two load balancers, but you can certainly have a larger array. And I've worked with larger arrays myself, but it's at least two. And then there's the reality here that if we lose one of these load balancers. If we have, say, two load balancers and they're both running you know, at 80% of capacity, if we lose one of those, a single load balancer failure could impact performance. And in that case, if they're both running, say, 80% utilized, a single load balancer failure will degrade performance. So we need to make sure that we have enough in the active-active configuration to sustain that loss. Now, the active-passive configuration where the active node is fulfilling all of the, the load balancing duties and the passive node is simply listening and monitoring the active device. And should that active node fail, then the passive node will take over providing redundancy. It's not going to scale as well, but it, uh, it's a perfectly okay strategy at lower scale. If one device is enough, we have that second device in passive mode just to allow us to deal with potential hardware failure. It gives us redundancy. If I mention NLB from this point forward, I'm talking about network load balancer, uh, or lo if I say load balancer, so NLB really means either of these things. Consider these three terms interchangeable. So the virtual IP address on a load balancer eliminates a host dependency upon an individual network interface. So when web traffic comes into the network load balancer from the virtual IP address on the front end, the request is then sent to one of the web servers in our example in the server farm on the back end. So if I just draw a simple picture here, we've got our NLB, we assign a virtual IP address or a VIP it's sometimes called. When that request comes in, the NLB is going to spread those requests over our back end server farm. So think of the front end as the VIP and the back end as our server farms in this case. And in terms of scheduling options, this determines 
how the load is distributed by the load balancer. And depend, it's going to depend on the device you're working with, but they typically have multiple options, like least utilize host, because the NLB will, will have some measure of status of the servers and the farms based on uh, that number, it will be able to make a decision as to which is least utilized. Now, it could be looking at pure connections. It could be looking at CPU utilization. Uh, there are typically a number of measurements that can be leveraged there. There's DNS round robin, which is where when the request comes in, the load balancer simply contacts the next server in the list. So it's really just going across the servers one by one, server one, server two, server three. That's not a very intelligent option, uh, but it's functional to a degree. And then we have affinity. That's when a load balancer is set to ensure that a request is sent back to the same web server based on the requester's IP address or the requester's IP address and port uh, or even their session ID. So it's pinning that user's request, their session to the same server. Affinity configuration can be referred to in, in tuples. Uh, often. So we can configure affinity based on, on IP and port or IP and port and session ID. We can, we can go all the way. You'll see load balancers with five tuple capability. But this is also known as persistence or a sticky session where the load balancer uses the same server for the session for that user. So moving on to network segmentation, let's start with intranet, which is a private network designed to host information internal to the organization. So collaboration here is going to be limited to employees, users within the org. And then we have an extranet, which is something of a cross between the intranet and the internet. And it's a section of an organization's network that's been segmented to act as an intranet for the private network, but also serves information perhaps to external business partners, which I find is the most common scenario, or even the public internet. And then finally, we have a screened subnet. This is an extra net for public consumption. It's typically labeled as a perimeter network or a, a DMZ. But network segmentation, if I could sum it up in one sentence, is a way to control traffic and isolate static or sensitive environments. Zero Trust. So Zero Trust Security addresses the limitations of the legacy network perimeter-based security model. It used to be that we'd simply put firewalls up at the perimeter, we'd have proxy servers to, to proxy internet access, and everything inside that boundary was trusted. So Zero Trust Security throws that out the window and really moves the security boundaries closer to the entities we're managing, closer to the identity. In fact, you'll frequently hear that Zero Trust treats user identity as the control plane. It is the gateway to accessing resources. And Zero Trust assumes compromise or breach in verifying every request. Bottom line, no entity is trusted by default. So this kind of supersedes trust but verify. So with Zero Trust, we're bringing those security boundaries from the traditional corporate network perimeter down to the identity, to the device, to the apps, to our information, protecting those entities anywhere they should reside in our environment or outside of our environment getting work done. So reasons for segmentation, and there are a few. So boosting performance so we can improve performance through a scheme in which we have systems that often communicate located on the same network segment, while systems that rarely or never communicate or should not communicate are located on other segments. Then reducing communication problems, we can reduce congestion by reducing the need uh, for crossing into other domains in our network or having too many talkers in a particular network segment. So we can just take the unnecessary traffic out and reduce congestion. It's kind of like the network addition of blowing your nose. Providing security. So this can definitely improve security by isolating traffic and user access to those segments where they're authorized. So if we have network segments hosting sensitive data, for example, customer databases, we can greatly restrict access to only the systems and users who need that access. And that's going to boost our security overall. So east-west traffic may come up on the exam. This is where traffic moves laterally between servers within a data center. 
Uh, North-south traffic incidentally moves outside of the data center. Then we have the Virtual Local Area Network, or VLAN. So this is a collection of devices that communicate with one another as if they made up a single physical LAN. So on a switch, a Layer 2 device, we can create a Virtual Local Area Network, a collection of switch ports that you know, could consist of users in multiple different locations, different floors, etc., servers in different areas, but they behave as though they're a single physical network. This creates a distinct broadcast domain. And then again, we have that screened subnet. So that's where we place a subnet between two routers or firewalls to say it another way versus how I said it earlier. And you'll have bastion host within that subnet. You'll see web servers frequently hosted in a screened subnet in a perimeter network. Let's move into VPN. So uh, a virtual private network uh, extends a private network and across a public network, basically enabling users and devices to send and receive data across shared or public networks as if their devices were directly connected to the private network. So one example is a user connecting from home to the corporate VPN so they can access corporate resources. But that's not the only scenario, so let's dig in a bit. So in VPN, we have always on mode, which is a low latency point to point connection between two sites. So this is typically a tunnel between two gateways that is always connected. So we'll see this connecting branch offices to say the main corporate office or to a data center. You know, L2TP and IPsec, this is the most secure tunneling protocol that can use certificates, Kerberos authentication or a pre-shared key but IPsec VPNs are going to be the top of the mountain when you have this discussion, generally speaking. So an IPsec VPN provides both a secure tunnel and authentication. And then we have an SSL VPN, which works with legacy systems and uses SSL certificates for authentication. This is going to be less common uh, by virtue of the fact that it's really a, a legacy construct. HTML5 VPNs, similar to SSL VPNs, in that they use certificates for authentication. They're easy to set up. You just need an HTML5 compatible browser, Opera, Edge, Firefox, Safari, just any of them these days. But IPsec, I expect, will be the one of most focus on the exam. So let's talk through some more IPsec VPN scenarios. So we have split tunnel versus full tunnel. So in the full tunnel scenario, it means all traffic goes across the VPN, whether it's destined for work resources on private subnets, or it's just internet browsing. And then we have split tunnel, which sends traffic destined for the corporate network over the VPN, and internet traffic goes directly to the, its normal destination, the normal route out the access point. You'll see this split tunnel configuration very commonly in work from home scenarios with users. Sometimes organizations will opt for full tunnel instead, and it just depends on whether they put a greater premium on saving bandwidth over that VPN, saving capacity, or if they're more interested in filtering and monitoring internet traffic for that user during work hours. And re remote access versus site-to-site. -site. The site-to-site -site scenario tends to use an always-on mode where both packet header and payload are encrypted, and it's always essentially always running. But in the site-to-site -site scenario, it's IPsec tunnel mode, and in the remote access scenario, it's the user initiating the connection. That's what we'd call IPsec transport mode. So moving on to DNS, domain name system. This is a hierarchical naming system that resolves a host name to an IP address. So we're going to talk about DNS in the security context. I may step slightly outside that boundary just for purposes of helping you better understand DNS. So DNS allows us to match a host name or a fully qualified domain name to an IP address. So a fully qualified domain name is the host name plus the domain, such as in this example, server1.contoso.com, or another example, www.microsoft.com. www is the host name, microsoft.com, the domain name, together those create and FQDN. So DNS supports many record types. A few that you'll see commonly are the A record, which is a host record, just simply a name mapped to an IPv4 address. 
we have a C name, which is an alias. That's how we can map multiple names to the same IP address quite easily, simply referencing that original host. We have the SRV record, which helps clients find services like a domain controller. In fact, your Active Directory domain controllers, when they boot up, when they start, they will register SRV records with DNS. Then there's the MX record, which indicates a mail server. Now these next two are going to step into the world of security firmly here. So we have sender policy framework or an SPF record. So this is a text record that's used by DNS to prevent spam and confirm email has come from the domain it appears to come from, essentially by allowing us to create a list of allowed senders. Then there's domain-based message authentication, reporting, and conformance, or DMARC. This is another DNS text record that's used by internet service providers to prevent malicious emails like phishing or spear phishing attacks. And to secure our email better, you will find SPF and DMARC are used together as portions of a more complete solution. I would say these records are used by just about everybody today. Then we have the DNS cache, which stores recently resolved DNS requests for later reuse, reducing calls to the DNS server. And that cache is a function of the DNS client, and that cache is present on Windows clients and servers and Linux clients and servers. And how long that lookup can be cached is determined by the TTL, the time to live that's specified on the record at the DNS server. Then we have a host file, which is a flat file where name and IP pairs are stored on a client for lookup. And it's often checked before the request is sent to the DNS server, although I'd say the host file is rarely used these days, but you'll find a host file on both Windows and Linux operating systems, both client and server. The DNS server normally maintains only the host names for domains it is configured to serve. The uh, domains for which it is considered to be authoritative, the authority. The root server, so DNS name servers that operate in the root zone, they can also refer requests to the appropriate top level domain server. So at the top of the DNS hierarchy, we have the dot, the root, and then you have some TLD servers, dot com, dot net, dot org. And then you have those second level domains, Microsoft, IBM, right? And that second level plus the first level makes up the domain, Microsoft.com, IBM.com. Now, in the world of security for DNS, we have DNSSEC, which, which is DNS security, and it prevents unauthorized access to DNS records on the server. So each record is digitally signed, creating an RRSIG, it's a resource record, uh, that holds a DNS sec signature for a record set to protect against attack. So know that that RRSIG, that resource record, is a digitally signed record. Now we're not talking specifically about attacks in this domain, but I want to bring up DNS attacks here in the context of DNS while we're talking about it and it's top of mind. So we have DNS poisoning where an attacker alters the domain name to IP address mappings in a DNS system to basically redirect traffic to a rogue system or perform a denial of service. And then there's DNS spoofing, where an attacker sends false replies to a requesting system, basically beating the real reply from a valid DNS server. Then we have DNS hijacking, which is also known as a DNS redirection attack. So there are many ways to perform hijacking. The most common way we see this done is through a captive portal, like a pay-for-use Wi-Fi hotspot in a public space. And then finally, there's a homograph attack, which leverages similarities in character sets to register phony international domain names that appear legitimate to the naked eye. For example, they'll replace the Latin character A by the Cyrillic character A in example.com. Uh, sometimes you'll see phony domains where the letter I is replaced by the number one or the letter L is replaced by the number one. To bottom line it for you, the, the focus of just about any DNS attack, the end goal is to send that user who makes a DNS request to a fake resource, whether it's a fake malicious website or fake application endpoint. Usually it's web-based. That right there is a, a pretty good picture of the end goal for any DNS attack. All right, let's talk network access control. So 
A desktop or a laptop off the network for an extended period of time may need multiple updates upon return to get back up to our corporate standards. Now, after a remote client has authenticated, what network access control does is checks that the device being used is patched and compliant with corporate security policies. And it might do that through some mechanism internally. What I see more commonly these days is the network access control feature on a network stack like Cisco will check in with your MDM platform to see if the mobile device management platform says that system is compliant and then it will allow a compliant device to access the LAN. Whereas for a non-compliant device, it may be redirected to a boundary network where a remediation service addresses the issues. That boundary network is sometimes called a quarantine network. And network access control can be agent-based or agentless. Uh, some operating systems actually include network access control as part of the operating system itself. So essentially no additional agent is required and these generally perform checks when the system logs into the network and logs out of the network making them less configurable which may be undesirable in some environments so if you need additional control or flexibility or functionality you might need a persistent or a dissolvable agent so in the persistent scenario that's a permanent agent that's installed on the host be that a windows client or a linux client uh, the dissolvable agent is known as temporary. It's installed for a single use. Uh, I worked with a scenario recently here where we used a Cisco integration with Microsoft Intune. So Cisco network access control simply checks with Intune to see if the device is compliant uh, before granting access. So we don't need an agent at all. Out of band management. So this enables IT to work around problems that might be occurring on the network, like the network itself being down in some respects. So out-of-band management on devices may include cellular modems or serial interfaces. In larger environments, this out-of-band management functionality may even be centralized. But it gives IT a way to respond and to manage when the network is not at its best. So in terms of port security, there are two types. There's 802.1. 1x and switch port security. So port security is when anyone authorized or not plugs their ethernet cable into the wall jack, the switch allows all traffic. With port security, the port is turned off. So this is considered undesirable as it limits functionality of the switch. We're disabling a switch. With 802.1x, the user or device is authenticated by a certificate before the connection is made uh, this prevents an unauthorized device from connecting. It allows an authorized device to connect, though. So this is preferable because we're not disabling the switch in any way. We're not limiting functionality. And there are some other protections that can be configured. So loop protection is when two or more switches are joined together. They can essentially create loops that result in broadcast storms. And spanning tree protocol prevents that from happening by forwarding, listening, or blocking some supports. Now, bridge protocol data units, uh, BPDU, these are frames that contain information about the spanning tree. A uh, BPDU attack will try and spoof the root bridges so that STP is recalculated. Basically throwing your switch into a state of recalculation and relative uncertainty. And a BPDU guard enables spanning tree protocol to stop such attempts. And then there's DHCP snooping, which is layer two security that prevents a rogue DHCP server from allocating IP addresses to a host on your network. And then there's Mac filtering. So this is creating an authorized list of wireless client interface Mac addresses, so the layer two hardware address. And within our wireless access point, blocking access to all non-authorized devices. Now, certainly this can come up in some Ethernet uh, wired network scenarios where you have uh, Mac filtering taking place for authorized nodes. Now, Mac spoofing is a way that some attackers get around this, faking a Mac address to appear as a legitimate authorized node on the network. Mac spoofing is a pretty easy thing for attackers to do. 3.3. So given a scenario, implement secure network designs. We'll talk about network appliances and the wide range of firewalls that are available.
So let's start with network appliances and the jump server. So this is a remote admin workstation typically pl placed on a screen subnet, AKA the perimeter network or DMZ that allows admins to connect remotely to the network to perform some admin activities. Then there's a Ford proxy. This is a server that controls requests from clients seeking resources on the internet or an external network. And then there's a reverse proxy, which works in the reverse direction. So this is placed on a screen subnet and performs authentication and decryption of a secure session to enable it to filter the incoming traffic. So forward proxy is outbound, request reverse proxy is the inbound. So flavors of intrusion detection system. So we, we talked about host-based intrusion detection and prevention earlier, uh, which uh, allows us to monitor activity on a single system only. It's, it's typically an agent on the host. The drawback there being that attackers can discover and disable them. Now, network-based intrusion detection can monitor activity on a network, and it's not as visible to attackers, generally speaking. So network-based intrusion detection and prevention, we haven't talked about yet at detail, but it's really IDS or IPS at the network level, generally in hardware form. So network-based intrusion detection, uh, analyzes whole packets, header and payload, looking for known events. And when an event is detected, a log message is generated. And then, of course, optionally, maybe an email notification, for example. And intrusion prevention in the network-based form, like host uh, IPS, the packet, header, and payload is analyzed, looking for known events. And when a known event is detected, a packet is rejected. So really, the difference between IDS and IPS is that one logs an event, the other takes action. And we have a couple of types of IDS systems that you'll be expected to know on the exam. So there's behavior-based, which creates a baseline of activity to identify normal behavior and then measures the system performance against the baseline to detect abnormal behavior. You'll also hear the, the behavior-based variety referred to as anomaly-based or heuristic-based. And then they're signature-based, sometimes called knowledge-based. This uses signature, similar to the signature definitions you'd see in antivirus or anti-malware software. Uh, with behavior-based, it can detect previously unknown attack methods. So it can detect emerging threats that maybe haven't yet been defined in a signature, where signature-based is only effective against known attacks for which a signature is available. Both host-based and network-based systems can be knowledge-based, behavior-based, or a combination of both of these. So also around network-based IDS and IPS, you want to be familiar with modes of operation. So we have inline mode or in-band, where the network intrusion detection or, or prevention system is placed on or near the firewall as an additional layer of security. In other words, traffic would be traveling through that device. The passive mode, out of band it's called, traffic doesn't go through the device. There are sensors and collectors that forward alerts to the network-based intrusion detection system. And on that topic of sensors and collectors, uh, these are two words for the same thing essentially. You can place a sensor or collector on a network to alert the intrusion detection system of any changes in traffic patterns on the network. And for that NIDS, if you place a sensor on the internet side of the network, it can potentially scan all of the traffic from the internet, which could be valuable in detecting anomalous behavior. So the hardware security module, or HSM, this is a physical computing device that safeguards and, and manages digital keys. It performs encryption and decryption functions for digital signatures, authentication, and other crypto functions. It's not unlike a TPM, except it's often removable or an external device where a TPM is a chip on a motherboard quite typically. So let's talk types of firewalls. We'll start with the web application firewall, abbreviated WAF. So these protect web applications by filtering and monitoring HTTP or HTTPS traffic between a web app and the internet, looking for common attacks like cross-site scripting, SQL injection, looking for those OWASP top 10 type attacks. And some of these web app firewalls come pre-configured with OWASP rule sets that you can apply to them to quickly get them up and running and protecting against these common attacks. And then there's the next generation firewall, abbreviated NGFW, which is a deep packet inspection firewall that moves beyond the typical port protocol inspection and blocking. 
I think the two defining characteristics you want to remember for the exam is that a next-gen firewall is application level inspection and it brings intelligence from outside the firewall, typically in the form of threat intelligence feeds. So continuing with types of firewalls, we have deep packet inspection. So this is packet inspection that both inspects and filters header and payload of a packet. So basically the header and the body. And it can detect protocol, non-compliance, spam, viruses, intrusions. It's going to be very capable because of the depth of inspection. Unified Threat Management, which you'll see abbreviated UTM. So this is a multifunction device composed of several security features in addition to a firewall. It can, can include a variety of functionality, IDS, IPS, uh, a TLS proxy, web filtering, quality of service management, bandwidth throttling, VPN anchoring, antivirus. These are going to be a lot more common in small to medium business scenarios, this multifunction, because all of that functionality in a single box is only going to scale so far. So let's talk firewall and state. So we have stateless, which is where the firewall is watching network traffic and restricting or blocking packets based on source and destination addresses or other static values. It's not aware of traffic patterns or data flows. It's typically faster and it performs better under heavier traffic loads, frankly, because it's doing less. And then we have stateful packet inspection, which you'll hear more commonly these days, which can watch traffic streams from end to end. They're going to be aware of communication paths and can implement various security functions like tunnels and encryption. It's going to be better at identifying unauthorized and forged communications. Then there's the Network Address Translation, or NAT, gateway, which allows private subnets to communicate with other cloud services and with the internet, but it hides the internal network from internet users. And the NAT gateway will typically have the network access control list for the private subnet. So it's going to restrict visibility and access for those inbound nodes. Now a content or URL filter it's going to look at the content on the requested web page and it's going to allow or block requests depending on the filters. And it's going to block inappropriate content in the context of the situation. So what you might call inappropriate is going to differ by your audience. It might be different in a school scenario versus adults in a work scenario. So open source versus proprietary. So open source is where the vendor makes the license freely available and it allows access to the source code, though they may ask for an optional donation. Now there's no, no vendor support out of the box with open source, so you might have to pay a third party to support you in a production environment. One of the more popular open source firewalls is PFSense, and there's a link if you want to go just see a scenario for what that open source option looks like. And then there are proprietary firewalls. These are more expensive because you have to pay for them, but they tend to provide more and better and more configurable protection. And many vendors work in this space. You've got Cisco, Checkpoint, Palo Alto, Barracuda. I'm just naming a few. Uh, what you won't get is source code access because it's proprietary and commercial. Hardware versus software firewall. So hardware uh, firewalls will be a piece of purpose-built network hardware. It's going to offer more configurable support for LAN and WAN connections. It often has superior throughput versus software because it is hardware designed for the speeds and the connections common in an enterprise network. A software firewall is going to be something you might install on your own hardware. It's going to give you the flexibility to place firewalls just about anywhere you'd like in your organization. Uh, on servers and workstations, you know, you can basically run a host-based firewall on just about any computer. The software firewalls are going to be more vulnerable in some respects versus hardware, as we discussed earlier, most, most importantly or simply because the attacker could potentially disable the process or service that represents that running software firewall. So next, let's compare application versus host-based versus virtual firewall. So application firewall is typically catering specifically to application communications. Often that's HTTP or web traffic. Uh, we did talk about one example of an app application-focused firewall in the next generation firewall, which has layer seven capability. Then there's host-based. So this is 
an application installed on the host OS where the application is the firewall. It's a software component like for Windows or Linux, and you'll find firewalls for both uh, the client and server operating systems. And then virtual uh, comes in the cloud where firewalls are implemented as virtual network appliances quite often, and they're available both from the cloud service provider. They'll have native solutions, but you'll also see third party partners, often commercial firewall vendors, that will offer some cloud specific uh, virtual network appliance for that CSP. So let's talk network device type. So firewalls are essential tools in managing and controlling network traffic. And a firewall is used to filter traffic. And it varies by type, but it may filter it anywhere from layer three all the way up through those application focused layer seven devices. Now a switch repeats traffic only out of the port on which the destination is known to exist. Uh, switches are known for their efficiency in traffic delivery. Uh, creating separate collision domains and improving the overall throughput of data. Switches are layer two devices. There are uh, a, a layer three switch you'll hear about occasionally, but when we're talking switch, unless otherwise specified, it's a layer two device. Routers used to control traffic on networks, used to connect similar networks and control the flow between the two. They can employ static routing tables or dynamic routing functions. These are layer three devices. And then there are network gateways that connect networks using different protocols. These are known as protocol translators. They can be standalone hardware devices or a software service. You'll see these built into uh, Windows uh, operating systems and sometimes Linux as well. Network gateways work at layer three. So route security. So routers are not designed to be security devices, but they do include some built-in capabilities that do provide some measure of security function. One of these being an access control list, which is used to allow or deny traffic. And if no allow rules exist, then the last rule is a deny rule. It's called implicit deny. And we can configure an access control list on the ingress, on the inbound traffic, and on egress, which is the outbound traffic of an interface. So for the exam, make sure you know the difference between ingress and egress, inbound and outbound. And that ACL will evaluate traffic on multiple criteria similar to a firewall in some respects. Quality of service ensures that applications have the bandwidth they need to operate by prioritizing traffic based on the importance and the function. So traffic of real time functions like voice and video streaming might be given greater priority. And that priority is often going to be human configurable. It will be adjustable based to your organization's specific needs. Well, let's talk about the implications of IP version six. So network security focus changes somewhat when we move to IPv6. One change is that there are many more addresses on V6 versus version four which means it's more difficult to perform a complete port scan or interface scan when we're working with IPv6 addresses. Now, the security tools like the port scanners and vulnerability scanners have long since updated their tooling to take advantage of IPv6. IPv6 creation long preceded its adoption, and IPv4 is still much more common on your private networks today in corporations. But because there are so many addresses available in v6, there's less need to perform port address translation or outbound network address translation on the network, which can simplify the communications process. But if we think about NAT in business use case scenarios, it is itself a security feature as it removes direct access to source uh, user and in some cases, internet browsing. With IPv6, we remove the address resolution protocol or ARP and without ARP, there can't be any ARP spoofing. So that's a bonus. It doesn't imply that v6 is any more or less secure than IPv4, but it changes the attack vectors. For example, a neighbor cache exhaustion attack can use IPv6 protocols to fill up the neighbor cache, interrupting network communication. So when we move to a new protocol, the attack vectors change based on that protocol's weak spot. Port mirroring, also known as port spanning, sends a copy of all data that arrives at a port on a network device over to another device or sensor for investigation later or in near real time. The switch, uh, we have a reserved port that will mirror all the traffic that passes through that reserved port. Now it works across multiple switches. 
because it's a logical configuration, whereas a physical device like a port tap requires installation uh, connected to every switch. And we might leverage spanning to inform the network intrusion detection system of changes in traffic pattern, for example. This will increase the load on the switch, so it should be configured with knowledge of the traffic type and volume that we're dealing with. We don't want to overwhelm the resources of the switch in terms of processing, memory, etc. Then we have monitoring services, which provide additional security on the network, usually in the form of qualified eyes helping us monitor network security and activity. This is very common with security information event management, SIM and SOAR functions that we talked about back in Domain 1 and Section 1.7. It's often an outsourced security operation center, a SOC function to provide qualified eyes on our network 24 by 7, monitoring and potentially alerting or remediating on issues after hours. Uh, and that might be helpful in maintaining compliance, really any sort of compliance. It might be HIPAA, GDPR, PCI obligations, anything where we, we have a need for high security and responsiveness related to our sensitive data. And then there are file integrity monitors that detect changes to files usually that shouldn't be modified, automating notification and potentially remediation. Uh, this commonly monitors files that would never change. Things like your operating system files where changes indicate some type of malicious activity. Where this can also be helpful is in detecting changes to your baseline configurations. If you have an unwanted change in your baseline, that can then proliferate to all newly deployed systems or configurations. Moving on to 3.4, given a scenario, install and configure wireless security settings. So we'll talk about uh, cryptographic protocols related to wireless functions. We'll talk about authentication in the wireless context. We'll talk about authentication uh, methods and setup methods related to wireless and installation considerations. There are going to be some physical, uh, some human activities in that section. So I doubt you'll be tested on it, but I wanted to drop a chart of the 802.11 standards here just in case, uh, in part so I could mention that in 802.11 uh, we saw the definition of wired equivalent privacy, which was really kind of the first attempt at wireless security, at wireless protection. So TKIP, Temporal Key Integrity Protocol, was designed as the replacement for WIP without the need to replace legacy hardware, so to improve security without the need for wholesale hardware replacement. And it was implemented into 802.11 wireless networking under the name WPA, Wi-Fi Protected Access. CCMP, which is Counter Mode with Cipher Block Chaining Message Authentication Code Protocol. So you can see why folks just say CCMP. So this was created to replace WEP and TKIP, the WPA standard we just talked about. It uses advanced encryption standard with a 128-bit key. We see AES used quite a bit today, although a 256-bit key is much more common in most uses today. Uh, CCMP is used with WPA2, which replaced WEP and WPA. So we have WPA2 that implemented CCMP for authentication, and that's again using AES encryption with a 128-bit key. And then in 2018, we see WPA3, Wi-Fi Protected Access 3, uh, which addressed the weaknesses in WPA2. It uses a much stronger 256-bit uh, scheme for encryption, GCMP256 it was called. There are two versions of WPA. There's WPA3, Personal for home users and WPA3 Enterprise for corporate users. So SAE3 is a relatively new 802.11 authentication method. It stands for Simultaneous Authentication of Equals. And it's used with WPA3 Personal and it replaces uh, the pre-shared key option in WPA2, which we'll talk about more in a moment. It protects against brute force attacks, though. And it uses a secure Diffie-Hellman handshake called Dragonfly. And it uses perfect forward secrecy, so it's immune to offline attacks. It's because you have a unique session key negotiated for each user session. So an attacker getting online, interacting with the network, and compromising a key from a past session does nothing for them in accessing future sessions. So W3A Personal versus Enterprise, let's break that down a bit. So W3A Personal uses SAE, 
which means users can use passwords that are easier to remember, and it uses perfect forward secrecy. And then we have WPA3 Enterprise, which supports 256-bit AES, whereas WPA only supported 128-bit. And 256-bit is actually required in several scenarios by the U.S. government, so that's significant. It uses elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman ephemeral uh, for its initial handshake. So wireless authentication protocols. So we have EEP, which is extensible authentication protocol. This is an authentication framework. It allows for new authentication technologies to be compatible with existing wireless or point-to-point -point connection technologies. And then there's PEEP, which is Protected Extensible Authentication Protocol, which encapsulates EEP uh, within a TLS tunnel that provides authentication and potentially encryption. And then we have LEAP, which is Lightweight Extensible Authentication Protocol. That's a Cisco proprietary alternative to, to TKIP or WPA. This was developed to address deficiencies in TKIP before 802.11i or the W. PA2 system was ratified as a standard. So continuing with wireless authentication protocols, we have EEP Fast, which was developed by Cisco, and it's used in wireless networks and point-to-point -point connections to perform authentication. It actually replaced LEAP, which was considered insecure after a time. We have EEP TLS, which is a secure version of wireless authentication that requires X.509 certification, so X.509 certificates. It involves three parties, a supplicant, which is the user's device, the authenticator, which would be a switch or a controller, and then the authentication server, which would be a radius server. And then we have EEP TTLS, which was a WPA2 enterprise scheme. It uses two phases. The first is to set up a secure session with the server by creating a tunnel, utilizing certificates that are going to be seamless to the client, so you don't have to do anything special on the client. The second phase uses a protocol like MSCHAP, to complete the session. This was designed to connect older legacy systems, really. 8021X is transparent to users because it uses certificate authentication. It can be used in conjunction with a RADIUS server for enterprise networks. And then we have RADIUS Federation, which enables members of one organization to authenticate to another using their normal credentials. So it's, it's federating. The trust is across multiple RADIUS servers across differing organizations. A federation service where network access is gained using wireless access points. So the concept of federation doesn't only occur here in the wireless authentication world. You may have heard of federation in Active Directory scenarios on-premises. Active Directory Federation services was pretty common to allow additional authentication methods to Active Directory on-prem. And in this case, the WAP forwards the wireless device's credentials to the RADIUS server for authentication. So we're tying that authentication to the back end. It commonly uses 802.1x as the authentication method, which relies on extensible authentication protocol, EEP, that we talked about earlier. All right, so, so going back in time a bit, there's WPA2 pre-shared key, which was introduced for the home user who doesn't have an enterprise setup, of course. So the home user in WPA2 PSK would enter the password of the wireless router to gain access to the home network. So PSK and WPA2 was replaced by SAE in WPA3, and that's the main reason I wanted to mention it was just to show you which newer solution supplanted this one. And then there was Wi-Fi protected setup, and with WPS, the password is already stored in the device. All you need to do is press the button to get connected to the network. The password is basically stored locally, so it could be brute force. That was one of the weaknesses there. This was a home use scenario, strictly a home use scenario. And the enterprise flavor of WPA2 or WPA3 is used in a centralized domain environment where you have a corporate scenario. And this often involved a RADIUS server combined with 802.1x using certificates for authentication. You would only see that in a work scenario. So captive portals. So these are common in airports and public spaces uh, where the Wi-Fi redirects users to a web page when they connect to the SSID. It provides additional validation of identity normally through an email address or social identity. It might include accepting 
an acceptable use policy, and they may offer some sort of premium upgrade for faster service. That's really common in airports, actually, that you get the slow boat for free and an offer of faster service for a price. Now, a site survey in a wireless scenario is the process of investigating the present strength and reach of wireless access points deployed in an environment to optimize the configuration. It usually involves walking around with a portable wireless device, taking note of wireless signal strength, and mapping this on a plot or a schematic of the building. Now, WAP placement, if you're installing a new access point, you want to make sure you place it in the right location. You want minimal overlap with other access points and you know, maximize the coverage that's being used in your environment. It should basically minimize the number of physical access points, which optimizes cost, right? We're, we're making the most of our hardware. You want to avoid placement near electronic devices that could create interference in areas where signals can be absorbed, metal objects, and bodies like elevators and concrete walls absorb signal. You're not going to get good wireless signal through an elevator door or through a concrete wall. And you want to ensure that the access point is in a place that doesn't send signal too far outside of your existing work areas, enabling unwanted access attempts, potentially from bad actors. Channel overlap. So in addition to minimizing coverage overlap, you want to choose different channels so there are no conflicts between your access points. And then we need to think about controller and access point security. So at home, you typically have a small number of devices, but in a large office, you're going to have potentially many access points, and each one of those has a separate configuration. Now, a wireless controller can enable central management of configuration as well as central management of security patches and firmware updates of the access points. So you're going to have to shop for a scenario that's designed for that larger scale corporate wireless scenario. And you want to use HTTPS to encrypt traffic to controller and WAP web interfaces. So ensuring that if you're connecting you know, to a management interface on a device, for example, that it's a secure connection. And on the access points themselves, we want to use strong authentication methods, never leaving default passwords in place. In 3.5, given a scenario, implement secure mobile solutions. So in 3.5, we're talking about mobile connectivity, mobile device management, and mobile device security overall. So let's start with communication considerations. So we have 5G, so fifth generation cellular, faster speeds and lower latency than 4G. Now unlike 4G, 5G also doesn't identify each user exclusively through their SIM card. You can assign identities to each device. And some of the air interference threats like session hijacking uh, that were present in 4G are dealt with in 5G. Now, 5G comes in two flavors. There's the standalone version and the non-standalone version. And the standalone version of 5G will be more secure than the non-standalone because the NSA version anchors the control signaling of 5G networks to the 4G core. It was kind of a hop in the process of rolling out 5G. And the non-standalone version supports that rollout process until the providers could get entirely to a standalone version. So why do I bring that up? Well, it ties control signaling to the 4G core, which brings with it some legacy security concerns and your major providers, at least in some locations, may still be running a non-standalone version. There are a lot of factors involved in getting up to standalone nationwide in all of their equipment. Now, in 5G, the diameter protocol, which provides authentication, authorization, and accounting, will be a target. Now, because 5G has to work alongside older tech, 3G and 4G are still a thing, right? We have many phones out there that aren't 5G capable. Old vulnerabilities may be targeted. And because uh, scale of IoT endpoint counts on 5G is exponentially greater, distributed denial of service is going to be a concern. Uh, you know, taking over a large number of a particular type of device on 5G, we could have a very large botnet we're facing there. Now, some carriers originally launched on that non-standalone version of 5G, which again, continues to rely on availability of the 4G core. How much of this is going to come up on the exam? I think probably not a great deal. I, I want to arm you with where uh, the security concerns come in with 5G, it, just so you're you're educated there and you may uh, 
be prepared for anything that could come up. So let's talk about SIM cards, subscriber identity module cards. So that's essentially a small computer chip that contains information about your mobile subscription. It allows users to connect to, to telecom providers to make calls, to send text messages, to use the internet. We know that SMS messages uh, are used as a second factor in authentication, and that's going to be tied back to your device, to your SIM card, and one of the auth factors most prone to attack is SMS, because SIM hijacking is an attack that has been executed in the real world. In fact, we've read uh, real reports of a bad actor walking into a mobile store, uh, you know, down on the corner and convincing the uh, person behind the counter that they were somebody they weren't and getting a new SIM card. So SMS as a second factor, strongly discouraged uh, for exactly that reason. Bluetooth. So that's 802.15. It's a personal area network. And it's a, definitely another area of wireless security we should be concerned about. It connects your headsets for cell phones, mice, keyboards, GPS, and numerous other devices. Connections are set up using pairing, where primary device scans the 2.4 gigahertz radio frequencies for available devices. So the primary device is your mobile phone in this scenario or any Bluetooth capable device, right? The primary device can be your smartphone, your tablet, your PC, scanning for available devices. Pairing typically uses a four digit code. If it uses a code at all, that code is often simply four zeros to reduce accidental pairings, but that's not terribly secure, is it? Then we have RFID, radio frequency identification. So this uses radio frequency to identify electromagnetic fields in a tag to track assets. This is pretty commonly used in shops as the tags are attached to high value assets to prevent theft. I'd be familiar with the use case for the exam. It's, it's really about uh, access badge systems and in retail scenarios, the anti-theft use case. We have near field communication, uh, which is built on RFID. It's often used with payment systems and it's subject to many of the same vulnerabilities as RFID. So you see NFC used in the touch pay system you might use at the grocery store to, uh, to tap your card in a touchless pay. Then GPS uses satellites in the Earth's orbit to measure the distance between two points. It's used in map and find my phone use cases. USB, universal serial bus. So some of your mobile devices can be tethered to a USB dongle to gain access to the internet. Uh, a flash USB device can be used to transfer data between devices. So certainly with USB, uh, it is a data exfiltration concern and it's in corporate environments, it's often blocked through policy, often a mobile device management solution. And then we have infrared, which is a purely line of sight medium. It has a maximum range of about one meter. Uh, we'll see this with uh, infrared printers, uh, which are more common in home use cases or work from home use cases. Infrared is not encrypted, but attack requires close physical proximity. Point to point connections. This is a one-to-one -one connection between two devices on a network, often describing a wireless scenario like a directional antenna connecting two wireless networks or a wireless repeater connecting WAPs. And then we have point to multipoint, which is uh, very common in 802.11 networks where we have a wireless access point connecting to multiple wireless devices, you know, the clients. All right, MDM, mobile device management. Let's talk about common features in secure mobile device management solutions. So passwords and pins. So with your mobile devices like smartphones, they're very easy to steal and you can conceal them by putting them in a pocket, right? So strong passwords and pins with six or more characters are going to be very important. In personal scenarios, I see many people with a four digit pin. So in a business scenario, you definitely want to move up to six characters, which you should really do in a personal scenario as well. Uh, this also allows for devices to be disabled upon X number of failed attempts. And then we have geofencing, which uses GPS or RFID to define geographical boundaries. And once the device is taken past the defined boundary, the security team can be alerted. So for the exam, I would remember that geofencing prevents mobile devices from being removed from the company's premises if desired. 
And application management uses whitelist to control which applications are allowed to be installed on the mobile device. And related is content management, which stores business data in a secure area of the device in an encrypted format to protect it against attacks and to prevent confidential or business data from being shared with external users. This will come up again when we talk about mobile application management, uh, which is very common with BYOD devices. Remote wipe. So when a mobile device has been lost or stolen, it can be remotely wiped. And the device at that point will revert to its factory settings and the data will no longer be available, except in the case of what we'd call a selective wipe or a partial wipe. So these wipe options in MDM solutions allow removing business data only. So in a scenario where a user brings their own device, BYOD we call that, uh, it wouldn't be appropriate for the company to wipe the entire data back to factory settings because it would remove the user's personal data. So you'll find the remote wipe options nowadays have a partial wipe option. Screen locks. Screen locks are activated once the mobile device has not been accessed for a period of time. After it's locked, the user gets a fixed number of attempts to correctly enter the pin before the device is disabled. Geolocation uses GPS to give the actual location of a mobile device. Can be very useful if you lose or drop a device for sure. For the exam, I would remember that geotracking will tell you the location of a stolen device. Push notification. So these are messages that appear on your screen even when your system is locked. Now this information is usually pushed to your device without intervention from the end user. And it may include sensitive information, right? We could potentially see a confidential email shown on a lock screen. And some MDM platforms provide policy-based control as to whether app notifications can appear with the notifications on the lock screen. So micro SD HSM, so that's a hardware security module. That's a physical device that provides cryptographic features for your computer. But in the micro SD HSM scenario, it's in a smaller mobile form factor. It basically enables associating a smaller piece of hardware with the cryptographic functions for encryption, key gen, digital signatures, or authentication that we get with an HSM. Unified endpoint management. So this provides management of the hardware like desktops, tablets, smartphones, IoT devices, ensuring that all of our endpoints are secure and compliant. And it can manage the security and applications on running devices. But you notice I mentioned desktops, tablets, smartphones, and IoT devices. So, so a defining characteristic of UEM is that fact. Now it can identify and block devices that have been jailbroken if we're talking about iOS devices or rooted uh, in the Android case. But again, multi-platform support is a key characteristic here. A uh, really common example of MDM is Microsoft Intune, which manages Windows, iOS, Android, and Mac OS. Mobile application management. So MAM allows a security team to manage application and data security even on unmanaged devices. Essentially, it controls access to company applications and data, and it can restrict the exfiltration of data from company applications. So we can prevent uh, saving data to unapproved locations, to unapproved apps. Uh, we can prevent copy and paste into unmanaged apps. This is going to be very useful in BYOD scenarios. Bring your own device, which enables business data access securely on a personal mobile device because we can put uh, security controls around just the applications and data without interfering with the personal data and functions of that unmanaged device. SE Android uh, includes SE Linux functionality as part of the Android operating system. It provides additional access controls, security policies, and it includes policies for configuring the security of these devices. Uh, prevents any direct access to the kernel of the Android operating system, which of course goes out the window if the device is rooted, which is why through MDM we want to make sure we don't allow rooted devices. It does provide centralized management for policy configuration and device management as well. So finishing out 3.5, we have enforcement and monitoring and deployment models around mobile solutions. 
So let's start with third-party application stores. So there's a, a danger of downloading apps from third-party app stores uh, as there's no guarantee of the security of the app being installed. So this could pose a security risk because the vetting process for mobile apps and third-party stores may be less rigorous than what we see in the official app stores like the Apple App Store, or the Google Play Store, or the Microsoft Store. Side loading. So this enables installing an application package uh, typically in an APK format uh, in the Android scenario on a mobile device. This is useful for developers to run trial of third-party apps they might be developing, but it also allows unauthorized software to be run on a mobile device. So rooting or jailbreaking. So custom firmware downloads are used to root an Android mobile device. It basically gives the user a higher level of permissions on that device. It removes some important elements of vendor security. Jailbreaking is what we call that in the Apple iOS world. That's the equivalent of rooting on Android. So make sure you're familiar with those two terms. And it allows you to run unauthorized software and remove device security restrictions, just like rooting on Android. Now, you can still access the Apple App Store even though jailbreaking has been carried out. For the exam, rooting and jailbreaking remove the vendor restrictions on a mobile device to allow unsupported software to be installed. So custom firmware is called out specifically in the exam objectives. We just talked about that in the context of rooting and jailbreaking, so I'll just throw it up on the screen again here as a placeholder. Carrier unlocking, uh, which is when a mobile device is no longer tied to the original carrier. It allows you to use your mobile device with any provider and also to install third-party apps. Very common that if you're making payments on a device to a mobile provider, they will lock that device to their carrier until you have made all your payments, at which point you can have that device unlocked so you can move carriers. Firmware over the air updates. So firmware is software installed on a read-only memory chip on a hardware device and used to control the hardware. And firmware OTA updates are pushed out periodically by the vendor ensuring that a mobile device is up to date and secure. A really common example is when the mobile device vendor sends a notification that there's a software update. If you're an Apple user, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Short message service or SMS. This is text messaging. It's become a very common form of communication. It can be sent between two people in a room without other people in the room knowing about their communication. However, text messages can also be used to launch an attack, sometimes without user intervention in any way. Then there's multimedia messaging service or MMS which is a way to send pictures as attachments. It's, it's similar to SMS messages but with um, media support. And then there's rich communication services or RCS which is an enhancement to SMS and it's used in services like Facebook and WhatsApp to send messages so you can see the red receipt. So you can see that the person on the other end has read the message. You can also send pictures and video, so rich media support. And the image capability makes MMS and RCS paths for data theft for sure. External media, so an SD card or other external storage media that you might plug into a mobile device may enable unauthorized transfer of corporate data, so data exfiltration. Uh, USB on the go. Uh, allows USB devices to be plugged into smartphones and tablets to act as a host for other USB devices. So attaching USB devices in this case can obviously pose security problems as it makes it easy to steal information. Apple doesn't allow USB on the go incidentally. Recording a microphone. So smartphones and tablets can record conversations with their built-in microphones. That could be used to take notes, but they could also be used to tape conversations or record the proceedings of a confidential meeting. Also an element of the device we can control through mobile device management if it is a managed device and not a BYOD scenario. GPS tagging. So when you take a photograph, GPS tagging adds the location where the photograph was taken. This could certainly be a privacy concern. Most modern smartphones do this by default. GPS tagging is on out of the box. So if you don't want GPS tagging enabled, it's generally a step you will have to take to disable. Next up we have Wi-Fi Direct and Ad Hoc. So Wi-Fi Direct allows two wireless devices to connect each other without requiring a WAP. And Wi-Fi Direct is single path, so it can't be used for internet sharing. 
On the other hand, ad hoc allows two devices to connect without a WAP, but it's multi-path, and they can share an internet connection with someone else. Tethering, which is when a GPS-enabled smartphone can be attached to a laptop or another device to provide internet access. Now, if a user uses a laptop and they connect to the company's network and then tethers to the internet, it may result in split tunneling, which presents a security risk if the device is compromised. Now, mobile devices can often also function as a Wi-Fi hotspot over USB or Bluetooth, just by the by. Payment methods. So smartphones allow credit card details to be stored locally so that the phone can be used to make contactless payments using near-field communications, which we talked about previously. So for BYOD, it needs to be carefully monitored as someone could leave the company with a company credit card uh, in their phone and continue to use it. MDM may prevent the payment function by disabling this tool in the mobile device management policies. Camera use. Smartphone cameras pose a security risk as trade secrets could be stolen by taking photos. And research and development departments for that reason uh, will often ban the use of personal smartphones in the workplace because we need the capability to control that camera function. Controlling that camera function prevents the theft of intellectual properties. MDM policies can disable cameras on company-owned smartphones. MDM can also disable screen capture, so taking screenshots of documents on mobile phones. Deployment models. So first up, we have bring your own device, or BYOD, very popular today, where an employee is encouraged to bring their own device so they can use it for work. It's cost-effective for the company. They don't have to buy the user a phone. It's more convenient for the user. They don't need to carry two phones. Uh, it does need a couple of policies, written policies, to be in place to be effective. One of those is acceptable use, and the other is an onboarding, offboarding uh, policy, just to establish expectations for both parties. So acceptable use policy outlines what an employee can do with that device during the working day. Then we have the onboarding policy where we set parameters for device configuration, like requirements to access corporate data, such as a minimum operating system, the device not being rooted or jailbroken, and even in a BYOD scenario using mobile application management, where we're managing only application and data and not the device, we can still specify, generally speaking, the OS and the rooted or jailbroken restriction. Then the offboarding policy, how corporate data will be wiped from the device. And as I mentioned earlier, most MDM platforms support a selective wipe, removing only company data rather than taking the device back to factory default. But MDM solutions with mobile app management functionality can manage corporate data on BYOD devices. Then we have the corporate owned model, which is pretty straightforward. It's a device fully owned and managed by the company. IT has full control over MAM and MDM options. Then we have choose your own device, CYOD. This is where a new employee chooses from a list of approved devices. It avoids problems of ownership because the company has a limited number of tablets, phones, and laptops. They offer simplifying management compared to the BYOD scenario. And when the user leaves the company and they offboard, the devices are taken from them as they belong to the company. They're corporate owned. So that's the difference between BYOD and CYOD. And then there's corporate owned personally enabled or COPE. This is when the company purchases a device like a tablet or a phone or a laptop and they allow the employee to also use it for personal use. So they use it for work, but they can use it outside of work. This is often a better solution for the company than BYOD from a management perspective because IT can then limit what applications run on the devices. And it also frees the company to perform a full device wipe if it's lost or stolen. In that BYOD scenario, if a device is lost or stolen, uh, you know, technically we're only authorized for uh, a selective wipe. And also in deployment models, VDI, our virtual desktop infrastructure. These are hosted desktop environments on a central server uh, in a cloud environment typically. It provides a high degree of control and management automation. And in the event of security issues, the endpoint can easily be isolated for forensic investigation if desired. Provisioning a new desktop is also generally just a push button operation. So it's highly automated and brings a high degree of control. VDI is a very common deployment solution for contractors and offshore teams. Which brings us to 3.6, 
Given a scenario, apply cybersecurity solutions to the cloud. So we'll be talking about cloud security controls across storage, network, and compute, and we will be talking about security solutions in the cloud. And in line with the Security Plus exam, we'll talk through these in a vendor neutral fashion. So the concepts we touch on here should apply more or less equally to the major cloud platforms like Microsoft Azure, Amazon's AWS, Google Cloud Platform, to name a few. They may have slightly different names for functions, you know, sometimes branding related, but these will apply more or less equally. So you have geographies, and a geography is a discrete market that generally consists of two or more regions uh, that preserve data residency and compliance boundaries. So you'll see geographies carved out per continent, generally speaking. You'll see something a little more granular in Asia with regards to the China carve out due to uh, laws for that country. And regions offer protection against both localized disasters as well as regional or large geography disasters. So within a region, you will typically see multiple data centers. So for example, I'm looking at an Azure map here, but the maps for Amazon and Google would be similar. So for example, in uh, East US, you'll see multiple physical data centers in that region. And for large geography disasters, the uh, CSP will automatically create region pairs where they pair a primary and a failover region to allow automation of service failover in the case of a large geography disaster. Say we have a, a tornado or a hurricane, for example. The region pairs are generally chosen by the CSP and that's in part due to the fact that they're configuring some automated failover of services that you need to do nothing about to allow to happen. And it also ensures that a good decision is made for that backup data center. They'll generally put 300 plus miles between the primary and the secondary they choose to match in that data center pair. And availability zones uh, offer protection at the physical location level within a region with independent power, network, and cooling. It's generally comprised of two or more data centers. It's going to be tolerant to data center failures via redundancy and isolation. And even with features like a load balancer, you'll typically see that uh, a load balancer can be zone redundant even with a single address. Resource policies to state what level of access a user has to a particular resource. And ensuring the principle of least privilege is followed is going to be very important for security and audit compliance, even in the cloud. So the rules don't change when we move to the cloud. And the CSP will provide details on how their cloud platform can help organizations meet a variety of compliance standards like HIPAA, like GDPR, like PCI DSS. Secret management. So our CSPs offer uh, cloud services for centralized secure storage and access for application secrets. So consider a secret anything that you want to control access to. It could be passwords, certificates, tokens, cryptographic keys, API keys, and this will generally support programmatic access via an API to support DevOps and CICD, continuous integration and deployment operations. And you'll see granular access control at the vault instance level, as well as to the secrets within. Then we have integration and auditing. So integration speaks to the process of how data is being handled from input to output. And a cloud auditor is someone responsible for ensuring that the policies, processes, and security controls defined have been implemented. That auditor will typically be a third party from outside the company. And they test to verify that process and security controls and the system integration are working as expected. Now, a few of those controls they may be testing might include encryption levels, access control lists, privilege account use, password policies, anti-phishing protection, data loss prevention controls, anti-ransomware. The process will typically be repeated periodically on an annual basis at most, or at least, and self-audits ahead of external audits are very common. So if we have an external audit annually, it's very common that we'll self-audit more frequently and certainly self-audit ahead of that external audit. So now we'll talk about cloud security controls around storage, including permissions, encryption, replication, and high availability. So your cloud service providers will 
assign each customer a storage identity and put them into different storage groups that have appropriate rights to restrict access at the tenant or subscription level. So we're really talking about the CSP controls at a service level right now. They will also put some default service level encryption in place as well, and they will typically restrict permissions from the public internet out of the box. And this is in part due to some hard fought battles in the past where we saw providers like Amazon have some very high profile breaches with their S3 storage buckets due to weak defaults. For relational databases, you'll see transparent data encryption uh, available for data at rest. Encryption for data in transit is typically TLS or SSL, which is really just industry standard. And replication, so a method wherein data can be copied from one location to another immediately to ensure recovery in case of an outage is available out of the box and in the cloud. Uh, generally speaking, multiple copies of your data will always be held for redundancy, even locally. Typically what you have are locally redundant options, zone redundant options, and geo redundant options. So you can choose your level of redundancy and of course understanding that in the cloud we're paying as we go, we're paying for what we use. So when we get into those uh, higher level geo redundant options, we get greater protection against regional or, or larger geographic failures, but we're paying more for that privilege. High availability ensures that copies of your data are held in different locations. An automatic failover between a region pair in event of an outage is very common. So you'll have to establish redundancy for your application to use that data that fails over between region pairs, but you'll find that for storage and some of the other underlying services that there'll be some failover by default that happens with no need for action on your part. It's built into the platform. So let's switch gears and talk cloud security controls for the network. So we'll touch on virtual networks, public and private subnets, segmentation. Uh, we'll revisit API integration briefly, and we'll talk about connecting our public cloud to our on-premises data center, a hybrid cloud we'd call that. So let's start with virtual private cloud. So this is a virtual network that consists of cloud resources where the VMs for one company are isolated from the resources of another company. And separate VPCs can be isolated using public and private networks. And within your networks, you can have multiple subnets. So at a subnet level, we'll have public subnets that can access the internet directly, generally through a firewall and protected private networks. Now virtual networks, can be connected to one another through a VPN gateway scenario, so a site-to-site -site VPN, so to speak, or through network peering. And again, the precise verbiage will vary from vendor to vendor, from Microsoft to Amazon to Google, so we're really speaking about this in a vendor agnostic way to the degree we can. And for VDI client scenarios, a NAT gateway for internet access would make sense, so clients can browse the internet safely. So private subnets, let's dig into this just a bit further. So I mentioned private subnets cannot connect directly to the internet, so they can be configured to go through a NAT gateway of outbound internet connectivity as desired. Uh, client VMs and database servers will often be hosted in a private subnet. This will be common for the VDI scenario for the virtual desktops. But this is not for public services like websites. It's going to be a, a different configuration for sure. A private subnet will use one of these address ranges, and these address ranges were not defined by the cloud providers. These were actually defined in RFC 1918, which specifies these address ranges as private, meaning they're not routable over the internet. And all other address ranges except for the 169.254 are going to be public addresses. And that 169.254 private range belongs to a self-addressing scenario that doesn't factor in the Security Plus exam, so we won't waste time on that. Now, moving on to public subnets. Uh, resources on a public subnet can connect directly to the internet, so public-facing web servers are often going to be placed within that subnet. And the public subnet may have a NAT gateway or a firewall for communicating back to private subnets and an internet gateway. Uh, public services like websites are typically going to be published through a firewall, so you might use a web application firewall, for example, 
in the case of a website. Uh, you know, the, the firewall you need in the cloud will depend on your use case. So VPC connectivity. We can connect to that virtual private cloud through a VPN using IPsec with a VPN gateway. It's called a transit gateway sometimes. It depends on the cloud provider you're working with. But we can set up a VPN for that connectivity. Uh, network peering is another method. So we can connect virtual networks in the cloud through a peering function that most of your providers will offer. Peering is actually the more common option between cloud networks. It's generally simple to set up and it's going to be faster than a, a site to site or network to network VPN connection. The site to site VPN option is common for on premises to cloud connectivity. That would be a hybrid cloud scenario. So segmentation. Now, security of your services that are permitted to access or be accessible from other zones involves setting up a set of rules to control that traffic. And the rules are going to be enforced by the IP ranges of each of the subnets. And within a private subnet, segmentation can be used to achieve departmental isolation or any manner of role-based isolation. For example, we might put our SQL servers over onto a specific subnet and then restrict ingress traffic to that subnet to just the application servers that need to talk to the database servers. So it really just depends on your use case in that respect. So for APIs, we're, we're talking about REST APIs, generally speaking, which is what you'll encounter with APIs today for the most part. This enables multi-language support. It can handle multiple types of calls, return different data formats, and we need to make sure that with APIs that we've implemented encryption, authentication, and hopefully rate limiting, throttling, and quotas. So these are going to help us from unwanted access and in the case of rate limiting, throttling, and quotas should prevent uh, disruptive attacks, denial of service attacks. We talk about this in Domain 2. So if you haven't watched Domain 2, go back and have a look at that section. So let's talk cloud security controls for compute. So security groups. Now, a cloud provider has to secure multiple customers, and they do use firewalls behind the scenes, but they can't grant individual customers direct firewall access that are used to keep the customers separate from one another. Instead, they'll use something of a security group to define permissible network traffic consisting of rules similar to what you'd see in a firewall rule set. A dynamic resource allocation, this uses virtualization technology to scale the cloud resources up and down as demand grows or falls. How this is implemented and if this is even available varies widely by the service and the configuration you're working with. For example, if you're working with infrastructure as a service with just standard VMs in the cloud, you're not going to generally have any sort of automatic scale up, scale down type functionality. But when you get into platform as a service or serverless, there are going to be some options. When we get into containers, dynamic resource allocation has some options available to you. So instance awareness. Uh, VM instances need to be monitored to prevent VM sprawl and unmanaged VMs because those are going to increase our attack surface and, and those will have security consequences. Uh, and they'll also add costs in the cloud. So it's not only a security issue, it's a cost issue when we go to the cloud because we're paying for what we use. So we can use intrusion detection and prevention to help detect new instances and, and process controls like privileged identity management, as well as change in configuration management are going to help us to prevent those unwanted deployments from happening in the first place. And a lot of your cloud service providers will offer some sort of policy tooling to help uh, tenants enforce governance policies. In other words, automating uh, management and, and restriction of who and what and where resources can be deployed in your cloud subscriptions. So you may see mention of a virtual private cloud endpoint. This allows you to create a private connection between your VPC and another cloud service without crossing over the internet. And again, I struggle with these because they're, they're a bit generic. Your, your network connectivity options really do vary by your, your cloud service provider. So we're talking very generic here in terms of these connectivity types. But you'll see your, your CSPs offer site-to-site -site connectivity options for hybrid cloud as well. So you can connect your on-premises data center into the cloud and a site-to-site -site VPN 
is the most common way we see that. Most of those providers will also offer some sort of premium option to connect your on-premises data centers and locations to the cloud without the need to traverse the internet. That connection will be faster, more secure, and also more expensive. Uh, most enterprises, large organizations today have implemented a hybrid cloud model. So generally speaking, they'll have on-premises resources and cloud resources, public cloud resources, as we're talking about here, and they'll connect those with some sort of site-to-site -site connection. So if your organization works with containers or you encounter containers in your work life, it's almost certainly going to be Kubernetes. So containers offer a more granular option for application and process isolation. If you're not familiar, containers run within a VM. So it's really multiple containers sharing uh, a single uh, operating system. Uh, most of your cloud service providers offer hosted Kubernetes services. Certainly Azure, Amazon, and Google all do. And in that hosted offering, they handle some of the critical tasks like health monitoring of the service and maintenance for you. It's really a platform as a service offering. You basically pay for the, what we'd call the agent nodes, which is where your containers will run, and the management cluster that handles some of the scheduling and management functions comes as part of the service. Kubernetes has really become the de facto standard. So containerization of our apps enables more efficient utilization of hardware resources, which is great for the cloud. But more importantly, it offers more, a more granular level of isolation for resources. Uh, we can control CPU and memory utilization at the container level. We're isolating processes in that container, restricting access to files and other system resources. So let's talk solutions. The first on the list in the exam objectives is Cloud Access Security Broker, or CASB. We use a CASB to enforce the company's policies between on-premises and the cloud with regards to apps and data. So a CASB can detect and optionally prevent data access with unauthorized apps, as well as data storage in unauthorized locations. Perhaps your organization is an Office 365 shop and they use SharePoint and OneDrive, we could use a CASB to make sure that nobody's trying to store data in their own personal box or Dropbox or Google Drive account. We see the phrase shadow IT associated with CASBs. With the CASB, we can identify unauthorized or unapproved tools being used uh, by our employees, and we can then potentially uh, implement controls to remediate those issues or block those actions. Application security, we can use you know, web app firewalls, next gen firewalls, which incorporate additional intelligence. We can use intrusion detection and prevention systems. And the right solution will depend on the application. For a web based application, a web app firewall is often the perfect solution. For compiled N tier applications, that are maybe a little more sophisticated, perhaps a next generation firewall will be more appropriate so we can get some of that external intelligence and some protocol smarts. So let's talk next generation secure web gateway, which was called out specifically in the exam objective. So firewalls function at the packet level using rules to allow or deny each packet inbound or outbound. The next gen secure web gateway works at the application layer at layer seven, looking at the actual traffic over the protocol to detect malicious intent. So functions in the next-gen secure web gateway can include web proxy, policy enforcement, malware detection, traffic inspection, data loss protection, and URL filtering. Quite a, a number of options in the box. You may see questions on the exam related to firewall considerations in a cloud environment. So one reason we need a good firewall is simply to filter incoming traffic to protect our cloud-hosted infrastructure and applications from attackers or malware. I'd mentioned that that web application firewall tends to be the most common we see in the cloud. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is cost. Uh, and another is that the web app firewall meets a common need. Protecting web apps is a pretty common ask. Uh, they tend to be easy to configure, uh, some that I've worked with. Uh, include OWASP rule sets that I can apply to the web app firewall right out of the gate so I have it configured very quickly. So it's cheap, it's easy, and it's purpose-built. 
Uh, so because it's less expensive than the more function-rich next-generation firewall and secure web gateway options, it's not surprising we see it a little more frequently. But you'll want to, to make sure you know some of those feature differentiations that we called out earlier around the firewalls. So network segmentation is important, and it should be supported with appropriate traffic filtering and restriction with the firewall type that's most appropriate for the use case. The firewall can filter traffic between virtual networks that we've segmented, as well as between virtual networks and the internet. And I've mentioned layers repeatedly, and if you're not familiar, now I'm talking about the layers of the OSI model, the Open Systems Interconnection Layer. So this is really a foundational concept of networking. And if you're not familiar, I want to just bring you up to speed quickly. So a network firewall works on layer three, a stateful packet inspection firewall at layers three and four. Uh, many of your cloud firewalls like web app firewalls uh, work at layer seven. So just in case you don't know what these layers are, I'm going to give you two charts that you can use to prepare uh, your foundational knowledge for the exam. So here's the OSI model, the seven layers, starting with the physical layer up to layer seven, which is the application layer. And here are some protocol examples. This will show you where the protocols live in the model. And not every protocol is terribly simple. For example, TLS shows characteristics of layer four and five, but, but never mind that. This is going to give you a foundation. And in case you're unfamiliar, Here's the OSI model by function, starting with the physical layer at layer one. So the physical layer contains the device drivers that tell the protocol how to use the hardware for transmitting data. Data link is where packet formation happens. The protocol data unit at the data link layer is the frame. At the network layer, we're adding routing and addressing information, source and destination addresses. The protocol data unit at the network layer is the packet. So if you hear uh, any discussion of packet, they're talking about the network layer. The transport layer manages integrity of a connection and controlling the session. So you'll have some protocols that will retransmit lost packets. Uh, they'll use TCP. Others will not worry about session and retransmission. Those will typically use UDP. At the session layer, layer five, we're establishing, maintaining, and terminating connection sessions between computers. Layer six is transforming data received from layer seven, from the application layer, into a format that any system, any protocol following the model can understand. And layer seven is about interfacing user applications, services, or the operating system with the protocol stack. So that's a quick study. It'll give you something to look at if you're not already familiar with the OSI model. So let's talk cloud native versus third party solutions. So platforms like Azure, like AWS, like Google Cloud Platform have their own tools. In the Microsoft world, we have Azure Resource Manager In AWS, there's cloud formation. And what I'm talking about here are technologies that support uh, automating deployment and standardizing deployment through a process called infrastructure as code, where we define our infrastructure, our networks, our VMs, our services in code. So it can be deployed in an automatic way. It can be monitored and assessed uh, on a recurring basis to ensure it hasn't drifted from the intended configuration. Uh, so, but they're separate tools for separate platforms requiring separate skill sets. Every platform has their own tooling. And that's where third party solutions can come in sometimes because they add flexibility, functionality, and perhaps most importantly, multi-platform support. Everyone wants to get to a write once, use multiple times state when they're in a multi-cloud scenario. Easier said than done, but if you have a single language uh, that supports multiple clouds, it can certainly ease operations for the team. So organizations will typically move to third-party solutions when the native cloud solutions don't meet their functionality needs or it's just operationally uh, too great a burden. For example, some organizations move to Terraform for infrastructure as code because it supports uh, the major cloud service providers using a single language. So if you understand how to write uh, code with Terraform, you can define your infrastructure, you can describe it, and deploy to Azure or AWS or Google Cloud Platform based on uh, a description of that infrastructure you've written in Terraform. 
And your CSPs offer a marketplace where third parties can publish offers. So, so whether it's Azure or Amazon or Google Cloud, they'll typically have a marketplace where, say, firewall vendors can offer their virtual network appliances like Cisco, like Palo Alto, uh, as a couple of examples. All right, moving on to 3.7. Given a scenario, implement identity and account management control. So we're going to talk identity concepts, account types, and account policies. And we'll start with identity providers. So the identity provider is what creates, maintains, and manages identity information while providing authentication services and almost always authorization services to applications. Uh, for example, Azure Active Directory is the identity provider for Office 365. And a few other examples would include Active Directory that we see on-prem, which is also a directory service. Uh, Okta and Duo uh, would be considered identity providers. So in the world of identity, there are a few concepts called out in the exam objectives. So an attribute in the context of an identity as a unique property in a user's account details, like an employee ID, something that definitively identifies that user. A smart card, a credit card-like token with a certificate embedded on a chip. It's used in conjunction with a PIN. This is a physical card. Then we have certificates. So a digital certificate includes two keys, a private key and a public key, and the private key uh, it can be used for identity. Any information encrypted with a user's public key can only be decrypted with the private key. So a token, a digital token, like a SAML token used for federation services or a token used by open authentication, OAuth2, we'd call it. SSH keys. Uh, when we're using SSH, SSH keys allow us to connect to a Linux server uh, using uh, secure authentication without the need for a username and password. So it's much like certificate authentication. The public key is stored on the server with the private key remaining on the administrator's desktop. It's just a key pair. Account types. So this language will vary a bit by cloud provider, but we're going to be talking in terms here that are universal for the Security Plus exam. So a user account, uh, we're referring to a standard user account with limited privileges, typically cannot install software and has limited access to systems. There are two types of user accounts. There are those that are local to a machine, so they only exist on a particular device, and those that access a domain, like an Active Directory domain or perhaps an Azure Active Directory account where it's part of a larger database. And then a guest account. This is really a legacy account that was designed to give limited access to a single computer without the need to create a user account. This account is normally disabled as it's no longer used and some administrators, I would say all administrators these days, view it for the security risk it is. And it's disabled by default. I haven't seen it used in a couple of decades. So I don't expect you're going to see much about that, but that should cover everything you need to know. A privileged account. So privileged accounts have greater access to a system and they tend to be used by members of the IT team. So administrators are an example of privileged accounts. Administrative accounts can install software, manage configuration on servers and clients, perform admin operations. And they also have privilege to create, delete, and manage user accounts, generally speaking. Now, administrators have been told they should have two accounts, one for routine tasks and another for administrative tasks. And they only use that administrative uh, account, that privileged account, when they need it. And historically, that has been true. You should remember this for the exam. What I would tell you in practice, if we, if we come to the cutting edge, is that is becoming less necessary because some cloud providers now eliminate this need and instead enable admins to activate privilege just in time using a single account. Because the fact of the matter is, if you're administering your environment from a Windows machine, the moment you log on with that administrative account, that account's credentials are in memory and we have to worry about credential theft should that endpoint, that workstation, 
be compromised. But for the exam, assume that the two account strategy is still something folks do. And I do see uh, customers and colleagues that I work with using that model, but more and more I'm seeing a move to systems that support just-in-time elevation of a single account, revoking those privileges when they are no longer needed. A service account. So when software is installed on a computer or a server, it may require privileged access to run with nobody at the keyboard. And a service account is really a lower level administrative account and kind of fits the bill here. It uh, is a type of administrator account used to run an application uh, generally unattended. So it's going to have purpose specific permissions. An example would be an account to run an antivirus application, so to run that service on an endpoint. You'll also hear this sometimes referred to as a service principle. A shared account. When a group of people perform the same duties, such as members of customer services at an organization, they may use a shared account. Now, when user-level monitoring, auditing, or non-repudiation, so non-repudiation being the ability to prove that an action was performed by a specific individual or a message was sent by a specific individual, uh, you have to eliminate the use of shared accounts. And I'll take that a step further to say that most cloud identity providers have options to eliminate the need for shared accounts and that would hold true for hybrid environments as well. So most enterprises are going to have access to a cloud identity provider to uh, supplement uh, Active Directory on-premises, and the need for shared accounts today, I find, is, is minimal, but when you use a shared account, you can no longer prove uh, down to a single individual who performed an action definitively. A generic account may come up on the exam, so a default administrative account created by manufacturers for a wide range of smart and internet-connected devices, you know, all the way down to a camera or your wireless access point. Uh, most of these are going to have a default username and password and of course default passwords should always be changed. Identifying the presence of these accounts should be part of the onboarding process for that device and addressed through configuration management in a corporate environment. Because that default username and password is a common attack vector. We talk about that a bit further in domain one of this series. Account policies, so complex passwords, sometimes known as strong passwords, are formatted by choosing at least three of the following four groups. So you'll want lowercase, uppercase, uh, numbers, and special characters. And identity providers sometimes will have limitations around what characters are allowed. You'll see this with websites where you might sign up for a subscription as well but virtually all are going to support uh, password complexity to a reasonable level. Now, password history prevents someone from reusing the same password. For example, if uh, the number of remembered passwords is 12, only on the 13th change could that password be reused. And password reuse is a term used in the exam that means the same thing as password history. Both of these prevent someone from reusing the same password. So to be crystal clear for the exam, password reuse and history are two ways of saying the same thing. Account audits. So an auditor will review accounts periodically to ensure old accounts are not being used after an employee changes departments or leaves the company. And an auditor will also ensure that all employees have only the necessary permissions and privileges to carry out their jobs. That's what we call the principle of least privilege. Location-based authentication can be implemented in policy just as an additional factor of the conditions of authentication. Uh, Geofencing can be used to establish a region and pinpoint whether you're in that region and if you're not in your expected location you're not able to log in. So context aware location can be used to block any attempt to log in outside of the locations that have been determined as allowed regions. Geolocation can track your location by your IP address and ISP. And uh, smartphones have location services that use GPS, so identifying your phone 
can be helpful in that respect. Now, when it comes to location, I do want to mention that many of your identity providers nowadays enable admins to predefine trusted locations. And what that means is that you can configure your identity provider. So if a user is logging into the network on a trusted device in a trusted location like a corporate office, you can forego that second factor of authentication, or you can maybe prompt them once in the morning and then allow them to go without responding to secondary factors over and over and over again. In fact, we find users are quite dissatisfied if they have to keep supplying that second factor when they're in a known location on a fully compliant managed device. Impossible travel time, I mentioned, that's a security feature you see used in cloud providers all the time, like Microsoft, to prevent fraud. If a person's in Houston and then 15 minutes later they're determined to be in New York, their attempt to log in will be blocked. And obviously we can see uh, some situations where you get false positives there if somebody is logging on to a system uh, that is located in New York, but they're logging on from Houston. We can sometimes see some challenges with that, but with the providers out there today, generally there is enough uh, user entity behavior analysis to establish regular patterns for a user that will eliminate these false positives. So a risky logon is a security feature used by cloud providers most often, leveraging a record of devices used by each user. And the response is going to vary by provider, but may include a confirmation email to the user to validate their identity or responding to a prompt in an authenticator app but how user and sign-in risk are used varies by provider. And then there's account disablement. So account management, the, the identity lifecycle we'd call it, ranges from account creation and onboarding to its disablement when the user leaves the company. And of course, disabling an account in a timely manner when a user leaves is going to be very important in preventing data exfiltration. Time-based logins. So we may establish uh, for some user-based roles that they may, uh, because they're shift workers, only log in during working hours. So we prevent them from logging in outside of working hours. Uh, for example, employees might be restricted to accessing the network between 7 a.m. and 6 p.m. Now this prevents data theft by preventing users from coming in at 3 a.m. when nobody's watching and stealing corporate data. And it can also be effective in preventing individual fraud, but also collusion, because the time restriction will enforce your schedule rotation, which is another element of reducing uh, unwanted data loss in our organization. If we allow people to log in 24 hours a day, then schedule rotations don't matter as much. This is going to be very common in some industries. I see this commonly in financial services, where certain job roles are only allowed to log in during the business day. In 3.8, given a scenario, implement authentication and authorization solutions. So we'll be talking authentication management, authentication and authorization, as well as access control schemes. So let's start with authentication management. So we have a password key, which looks like a USB device, and it works in conjunction with your password to provide multi-factor authentication. So it's a physical device. One example is YubiKey, which is a, a FIPS 140-2 validation that provides code storage within a tamper-proof container. And then a password vault. So a password vault is stored locally on a device, and it stores passwords so the user doesn't need to remember them. These are very common for PCs, and... They use strong encryption. AES-256 is very common for secure storage. They're only as secure as the owner password that's used to protect the vault itself. Uh, and they typically use multi-factor authentication. A type of password vault exists in the cloud for DevOps scenarios, which we'll talk about later in this module. But for that password vault, I increasingly see the Authenticator apps that are available, like Microsoft's Authenticator app and Google's Authenticator app, offering to function as that centralized storage for all your passwords. Now, here are a couple of concepts brought up in the authentication and authorization context. TPM, which we talked about much earlier in this module. So the Trusted Platform module, again, is typically a chip on the motherboard, and it's used to store key pairs when we're using full disk encryption. 
And then the HSM, the hardware security module, is used to store encryption keys. It's a key escrow that holds private keys for third parties. And the HSM uh, may be a separate device or removable. Knowledge-based authentication. So this is normally used by banks and financial institutions or email providers to identify someone when they want a password reset. And there are two different types of knowledge-based authentication. There's dynamic and static. And I think one of these will stand out to you as being much stronger than the other. So let's start with static. These are questions that are common to the user, but these are questions that the user has provided answers to beforehand. So an example would be, what is the name of your first school? They may ask the name of your first pet, your kindergarten teacher, etc. They are going to be questions that could potentially be researched by a bad actor uh, from your social media profiles, for example. Now, dynamic knowledge base authentication is a bit different. It's deemed to be more secure because they don't consist of questions provided beforehand. So for example, a bank will ask to confirm your identity. They'll ask you for three uh, direct debit mandates. They'll ask for the date and the amount paid. You know, something that you can't predict beforehand and that would only be accessible to you as it requires knowledge of your banking transactions. So authentication protocols, there's PAP, Password Authentication Protocol. This is a password-based protocol used by point-to-point -point protocol to validate users. It's supported by almost all network OS remote access servers, but it's considered weak at this point. It's really legacy. And then there's CHAP, Challenge Handshake Authentication Protocol, a user or a network host uh, as an authenticating entity. That entity may be, for example, an internet service provider requires that both the client and the server know the plain text of the secret, although it's never sent over the network. And then we have EAP, Extensible Authentication Protocol, which we talked about previously. This is an authentication framework. It allows for new authentication technologies to be compatible with existing wireless or point-to-point -point connection technologies. So extensible authentication protocol is really your most common go-to today. And then there's 802.1x authentication, which is an authentication mechanism to devices wishing to attach to a LAN or a wireless LAN. It really describes encapsulation of the EAP protocol. And it involves three parties, a supplicant, an authenticator, and an authentication server. So the supplicant is a client, and the authenticator forwards the request, the credentials, over to the authentication server that decides whether or not the request will be authenticated. So 802.1x authentication defines encapsulation of EAP over uh, IEEE 802.11. It's also known as EAP over LAN. Now we have multiple protocols in the area of authentication, authorization, and accounting services that show up in the exam objectives. And these come up in remote access scenarios frequently. So a network access server is a client to a RADIUS server and the RADIUS server provides the authentication authorization and accounting services or the AAA services I like to call them. So we have RADIUS which uses UDP and encrypts the password only. We see RADIUS commonly in remote access scenarios like VPN. TACX Plus uses TCP and encrypts the entire session. We see that pretty commonly in admin access to network devices, pretty common in the Cisco world, for example. And then we have Diameter, which is based on RADIUS, and it improves many of the weaknesses of, of RADIUS, but Diameter is not actually compatible with RADIUS. We see uh, Diameter used with 4G. And then the, I guess the other way you could remember these is RADIUS is, is UDP and encrypts password only. TAC access TCP and encrypts the entire session and then just park diameter in your head as that uh, mobile scenario. And it's 4G, but if you have a 5G network that's non-standalone, it's still tied back to the 4G core, then diameter factors in that 5G scenario. But network access or remote access is the use case at the highest level I'd remember for the exam. So let's talk single sign-on. So single sign-on means a user doesn't have to sign in to every application 
that they use. The user logs in once and that credential is used for multiple apps. Single sign-on based authentication systems are sometimes called modern authentication. So to say it another way, single sign-on is a mechanism that allows subjects, think user, to authenticate once and access multiple objects, resources that is, without authenticating again. So some common single sign-on methods and standards include SAML, Sesame, CryptoNight, OAuth, uh, typically the OAuth2 standard, and OpenID. So for the exam, the three to know, I would believe would be SAML, OAuth2, and OpenID. I would know enough to differentiate these three should they show up as answers on the exam. So let's touch on all three of these right now at a little bit greater depth. So Security Assertion Markup Language, or SAML, is an XML-based open standard data format for exchanging authentication and authorization data between parties, in particular, between an identity provider and a service provider. So this is really common in on-premises federation scenarios with Active Directory, where we see Active Directory Federation services. And then there's OAuth 2.0, which is an open standard for authorization. It's commonly used as a way for internet users to log into third-party websites using their Microsoft, Google, Facebook, Twitter, any of these accounts without exposing their password. So Azure AD, the identity provider for Office 365, supports OAuth 2 flows. OpenID, this is another open standard. It provides decentralized authentication, allowing users to log into multiple unrelated websites with one set of credentials maintained by a third party service referred to as an OpenID provider. So an example here would be logging into Spotify with your Facebook account. The so Kerberos. So Kerberos is an author authorization protocol in Microsoft's Active Directory, uh, which we find on-premises in enterprise organizations pretty commonly. And Kerberos is preferred to NTLM, which is really something of a legacy authorization protocol in the Windows world. Kerberos provides stronger encryption, interoperability, and mutual authentication. Basically, client and server are verified. It runs as a third-party trusted server known as the Key Distribution Center, or KDC. It includes an authentication server, a ticket granting service, and a database of secret keys for users and services. So it's using tickets as opposed to passing around password hashes. It helps prevent replay attacks through timestamps. With NTLM, you'll hear about pass the hash attacks, and with Kerberos, you'll hear about pass the ticket attacks. But timestamps will help reduce Kerberos' uh, vulnerability to attack. So let's talk about access control schemes. We'll start with non-discretionary access control, which enables the enforcement of system-wide restrictions that override object-specific access control. RBAC, role-based access control, is considered non-discretionary. And I said that as though it's important because role-based access control is what we see in the world of Windows, in Active Directory, in Azure Active Directory, so it's exceedingly common as an access control scheme today. But we'll talk about RBAC in just a moment. Okay, so next up, we have discretionary access control, or DAC. And now a key characteristic of discretionary access control model is that every object has an owner, and the owner can grant or deny access to any other subject. So when I talk about subjects and objects in the context of authentication and authorization and access control, a subject would be your user, the entity that wants to be authorized to access a resource, and the, the object is the resource. So subject is that entity that wants access, and the object is the resource they are accessing. So discretionary access control is use-based and user-centric in that respect. So again, object is resource, subject is user. I'll just pencil it in the upper right there so you have it. 
An example of, of a discretionary access control system would be NTFS. Role-based access control. A key characteristic of RBAC is the use of roles or groups. So instead of assigning permissions directly to users, user accounts are often placed in roles and administrators assign privileges to the roles or to the groups. In fact, when you get into best practices with role-based access control in Active Directory on-premises, our best practice is to use groups. And in Azure Active Directory, we're using groups and roles typically. And then there's rule-based access control. And a key characteristic of rule-based access control is that it applies global rules that apply to all subjects. So rules within this model are sometimes referred to as restrictions or filters. An example here would be a firewall uses rules that allow or block traffic to all users equally. A key point about the mandatory access control model is that every object and every subject has one or more labels. And these labels are predefined and the system determines access based on assigned labels. Attribute-based access control. So in this case, access is restricted based on an attribute on the account, such as department, location, or functional designation. For example, an admin requ may require user accounts to have the legal department attribute to view contracts. Privileged access management. This is a solution that helps protect the privileged accounts within a domain, preventing attacks such as pass the hash and privilege escalation. It also provides visibility into who is using privileged accounts and what tasks they are being used for. And these privileged accounts need additional layers of protection, really. So you'll find privileged access management is native to some cloud identity providers today, and it may include a just-in-time elevation feature where that privileged user can request permission to activate that privilege for a limited period of time. So let's talk file system permissions. We'll start with NTFS, which is a Windows construct. And NTFS permissions are applied to every file and folder stored on a volume formatted with the NTFS file system. If you've worked with Windows, you've probably seen this interface before. Well, you'll see the groups or usernames and then the permissions uh, that they are granted down in the window below. And you can get into the advanced area into special permissions and configure inheritance. So that can determine if you're applying permissions to just a specific object or to that object and all child objects. So on Linux, we have a permissions model that has two special access modes called set user ID and set group ID. So it recognizes three types of permissions and at three levels. So it recognizes read, write, and execute. And there's a numeric value assigned to each of those. So read is four, write is two, execute is one. So for example, seven would be read, write, and execute access. Six would be read and write. Five would be read and execute. So that's what it would look like. And you'll see that at the three levels, we have owner, group, and other. So owner is the user who created the file. A group would be a collection of users granted access. And other would be any user assigned permissions who did not create the file, who is not the owner. And moving on to 3.9, given a scenario, implement public key infrastructure. So we're going to be talking about certificate services and we'll touch on public key infrastructure concepts, types of certificates and certificate formats. This is a topic where I find many folks struggle. I have a lot of job experience with PKI, so I'm going to call out key associations that will help you lock in your brain what you need to get through PKI on the exam and to understand how PKI works a little better, even if you've not used it before. So let's start with some concepts here. So key management is really referring to management of cryptographic keys in a crypto system. Operational considerations when we think about PKI include dealing with 
generating our keys, exchanging keys, storage, using these, destroying keys, replacing keys. So all of the issuance and revocation, the, the life cycle management really. From a design perspective, we need to think about the protocols we're choosing because PKI is going to give us some options when it comes to cryptographic protocols and we need to pick strong protocols. We need to design our PKI system in such a way that if a server in our infrastructure is compromised, it doesn't uh, compromise all of the certificates that have been issued. So we'll need to look at user procedures. So who has access in a PKI system? We don't want one user to have access to all functions. So a role separation uh, will be very important. And there are going to be some supporting protocols that we'll talk about. So at the base of a PKI uh, infrastructure is your certificate authority or a certification authority. This is the server that creates digital certificates and owns the policies. Now, a PKI hierarchy can include a single CA that serves as what we'd call the root certificate authority and the issuing authority, but this isn't recommended. A single, a single level PKI infrastructure we'd only see in a small environment, and it's not going to be the most secure because if that server is compromised, the whole solution is shot. All of your certificates you've issued are compromised. So what we'll see in larger environments and more secure designs is a second tier or a middle tier we call a subordinate CA, sometimes called an intermediate certificate authority or a policy certificate authority. Uh, it's also known as a registration authority. It sits below the root CA in the CA hierarchy. It regularly issues certificates, making it more difficult for these to stay offline. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is your root certificate authority is typically maintained in an offline state and it's only brought online for renewing its root certificate or issuing certificates to subordinate CAs or issuing CAs, which we'll talk about in a moment. Now, a subordinate CA does have the ability to revoke certificates, making it easier to recover from any security breach that does happen. Now, the certificate revocation list contains information about any certificates that have been revoked by a subordinate CA due to compromises to the certificate itself or the PKI hierarchy. So CAs are required to publish certificate revocation lists, but it's up to the certificate consumer as to whether or not they check these lists and how they respond if a certificate has been revoked. So you'll see your browsers today, Chrome, Firefox, etc. They'll throw up a big warning if they hit a website and a certificate has expired. You'll get a warning that it's no longer safe. So online certificate status protocol offers a faster way to check a certificate status as opposed to a CRL. With, with OCSP, the consumer of a certificate can submit a request to the issuing certification authority to obtain the status of a specific certificate rather than checking the certificate revocation list, which is a file. In a large environment with lots of traffic, we can find that CRL, that file, gets quite large potentially. A certificate signing request, or CSR, records identifying information for a person or a device that owns a private key as well as information on the corresponding public key. It's the message that's sent to the CA in order to get a digital certificate created. We create a certificate signing request in order to request that a new certificate be issued. The common name, or CN, as it's commonly written, is the fully qualified domain name of the entity, like the web server, for example. Subject alternative name. So this is an extension to the X.509 certificate specification that allows users to specify additional host names for a single certificate. This is pretty commonly used today in advanced scenarios. It's standard practice for SSL certificates and it's on its way to replacing the use of the common name. But it enables support 
for FQDNs from multiple domains in a single certificate. And it's commonly abbreviated as a SAN. So you'll, you'll see requests for a SAN certificate and the providers like DigiCert, for example, in the public space will abbreviate that as SAN pretty commonly. But multiple domain support is the key. Certificate expiration. So your certificates are valid for a limited period of time from the date of issuance as specified on the certificate itself. And the industry uh, specifies guidance here. So current guidance says the maximum certificate lifetime from widely uh, trusted issuing authorities like DigiCert is currently one year, little over one year, 398 days. This number has gotten shorter and shorter over time. So let's talk types of certificates for a moment. We have a wildcard certificate that can be used for a domain and a subdomain. For example, in the contoso.com domain, there are two servers called web and mail. The wildcard certificate is essentially the asterisk. So it's just that wildcard character .contoso.com. And when it's installed, it would work for the FQDNs for both of these, web.contoso.com and mail. .contoso.com. So a wildcard can be used for multiple servers in the same domain. So it supports multiple FQDNs with the same domain suffix, which can save us money because we, especially if we're buying a certificate from a trusted authority online because we're publishing a website, for example, to the internet, we need a certificate from an issuing authority outside of our organization that's trusted by the world at large a wildcard certificate is going to save us money. So let's compare that again to the SAN certificate that I mentioned a moment ago. The subject alternative name can be used on multiple domain names for a single certificate. So for example, we could attach abc.com and xyz.com to the same certificate. In fact, you can also insert other information into a SAN certificate, such as an IP address. But the key here is multiple domains in a single certificate. I've seen a SAN certificate with 20 entries on it, with many domains, multiple IP addresses. We see organizations leaning on this more and more often. And you pay for these SAN certificates with these external issuing authorities like DigiCert, typically based on the number of entries you want on the certificate. A SAN with five entries is going to be less expensive than a SAN cert with 20 entries on it. A code signing certificate. So when code is distributed over the internet from a software company, for example, it's important that users can trust that it was actually produced by the claimed sender. An attacker would love to produce a fake device driver or a web component uh, that it says is from a software vendor, but isn't really. So using a code signing certificate to digitally sign the code mitigates this danger. Microsoft, Dell, any software or hardware company that is releasing software or little utilities, they will almost always sign those nowadays. But code signing provides proof of content integrity. Self-signed certificates. These are issued by the same entity that's using it. It doesn't have a CRL. It can't be validated or trusted. But it's the cheapest way for using internal certificates. It's really commonly used in a lab. It can be placed on multiple servers. But it's only going to work within our organization. Machine or computer certificates are used to identify a computer within a domain. So a device can be authenticated. An email certificate allows users to digitally sign their emails to verify their identity through the attestation of a trusted third party known as a certificate authority. It allows users to encrypt the entire contents of email, messages, attachments, all of it. A user certificate represents a user's digital identity. In most cases, a user certificate is mapped back to a user account and access control can then be based on that user account. In most cases, a user certificate is mapped back to a user account, such as in Active Directory. 
So I know this is a lot. I want you to stick with me. I'm going to tie these PKI concepts together here in just a moment. I'm going to walk you through a scenario. I'll show you uh, a little picture here and we'll try to, to just tie all of this information together for you in your head. I know I'm hitting you with a lot of information here, but PKI is very important. And if you understand these concepts, you are in the minority. You're in the minority that you want to be a member of, the people who know PKI. So a root certificate is a trust anchor in a PKI environment. It's the root certificate from which the entire chain of trust is derived. We'll look at this in a picture here in a minute. I'll just draw it. This is the certificate of the root certification authority at the top of the hierarchy. It's where the chain of trust begins. Domain validation. So a domain validated certificate is an X.509 certificate that proves ownership of a domain name. Then you'll occasionally see extended validation certificates. These provide a higher level of trust in identifying the entity that's using the certificate. These aren't something you see every day, but they're commonly used in the financial services sector. When there is money involved, important transactions, it's more likely you're going to see an extended validation certificate. So I mentioned the chain of trust. Let's touch on these certificate authorities we talked about here in the last few minutes. So the issuing CA or issuing certificate authority is the server that's issuing certificates to users and devices. I mentioned a subordinate CA. This is sometimes called an intermediate CA or a policy CA. So the subordinate CA will issue certificates to issuing CAs. It's really there just for policy and these uh, issuing CA assignments in the middle of the hierarchy. And what that allows us to do is to maintain our root certificate authority in an offline state. So that right there is our chain of trust. A certificate that is issued by that issuing CA at the bottom of the chain will be validated all the way up to that root certificate. But our root server does not have to be online and it is Always recommended that that root CA is maintained in an offline state. You only bring it online for the occasional operation, such as issuing a certificate for a, a new subordinate CA. You know, if we have, for example, uh, a CA that is compromised, then we'd need to bring that root online. We'd need to revoke a certificate and issue a new one for a different subordinate, for a new replacement subordinate. And you'll bring your root CA on, online to patch it every now and again. But that's what the hierarchy looks like. So I hope that makes that a little more plain if you're new to PKI. Now you may see questions about certificate file formats. Now X.509 certificate formats and descriptions are in this table here. And I've outlined the important information for you so you can remember these more easily for the exam. So when you export a certificate to a file or you are granted a certificate in a file, you can tell a lot about that file based on the file extension, which I have listed there in the ext column. And then I've also listed here uh, as to whether or not that file format contains the private key. Because remember, certificates are not whole without the private key. It consists of two keys, a public key and a private key. And you'll see here, for example, with the DER format, it does not include the private key. And you'll see a dis the description column describes the common use for that format. So you see the DER format, PEM, PFX, CER, P12, P7B, and whether or not it includes the private key. But this should give you everything you need for remembering these formats. But just chunk these together. You'll notice of those six formats, three include the private key and three do not. So how do the private key and public key work together? This is confusing to a lot of folks. I'm going to take you through a scenario that will clear that right up. So we have here Franco and Maria. So Franco sends a message to Maria requesting her public key. So Maria has a public key and a private key in her certificate. The public key she can share with anyone. So she sends that back to Franco, or more likely her application sends that back to Franco. 
Franco uses Maria's public key to encrypt a message and he sends it to her. Maria uses her private key to decrypt the message. And a message that is encrypted with Maria's public key can only be decrypted using Maria's private key, which only Maria holds, and she will not share that with anyone. It's a private key. And that key exchange that I just described here, this transaction applies to a wide variety of use cases that you might encounter on the exam. So I want to talk through just a few additional PKI concepts that are called out in the exam objectives. So an online versus an offline certificate authority. So an online CA is always running, meaning the computer is on. An offline CA is kept offline except for specific issuance and renewal operations. Remember, offline is best practice for your root CA. Stapling. So stapling is a method used with online certificate status protocol, which allows a web server to provide information on the validity of its own certificate. This is done by the web server essentially downloading the OCSP response from the certificate vendor in advance and providing it to browsers without going back to the OCSP endpoint. Pinning. This is a method designed to mitigate the use of fraudulent certificates. So once a public key or certificate has been seen for a specific host, that key or certificate is pinned to the host. So should a different key or certificate be seen for that host, that might indicate an issue with a fraudulent certificate. Trust model. So a model of how different certificate authorities trust each other and how their clients will trust certificates from other certification authorities. There are four trust models in PKI. The four main types are bridge, hierarchical, hybrid, and mesh. So that picture I drew for you of the issuing CA, subordinate CA, and root CA, that is, as you might guess, the hierarchical model, and that is far and away the most common. Key escrow. Key escrow addresses the possibility that a cryptographic key may be lost, and the concern is usually with symmetric keys or with the private key in asymmetric cryptography. So remember, with symmetric cryptography, there's only one key in use. So if you lose that key, that's a problem, right? Uh, with asymmetric cryptography, more often than not, we're dealing with the loss of the private key, which doesn't exist in many places because it's not shared. And if that loss occurs, then there's no way to get the key back and the user can't decrypt messages. So organizations will establish key escrows to enable recovery of lost keys. And certificate chaining, which refers to the fact that certificates are handled by a chain of trust. So you purchase a digital certificate from an issuing authority, so you trust that CA's certificate. In turn, that CA trusts a root certificate, probably on an offline root CA. And there you have it. Congratulations, you've reached the end of domain three. I appreciate you sticking with me. This is a big domain. I hope you're getting value out of the series. Reach out to me with questions anytime in the comments below this video or directly on LinkedIn. I'm always happy to talk if I can help you as you prepare for the exam. Expect modules four and five covering domains four and five in just the next few days. And until next time, take care and stay safe.